Welcome, everybody. Uh, hereby adjourn the Santa Barbara Unified School Board. Open. <laughs> adjourn. We're not adjourning yet. <laughs> uh, we are opening the meeting at 6.34 here uh, on January 28th, 2020. Um, welcome, everybody. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay, with that, um, let's see. We are going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Matsoka. Uh, please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everybody. We have Spanish interpretation. Buenas tardes a todos. Tenemos interpretación al español. Por si alguien gusta escuchar la presentación en español, puede tomar unos audífonos. Gracias. Thank you. We also have headsets for anyone who is hearing impaired. Okay. Um, we, uh, item number five, there are C5. There are no announcements of closed session, session action. So we will move to item C6, which is the superintendent's report. Mr. Matsuoka. All right, good evening all, community, staff, um, and to our school board. So there are many of you who are here about uh, La Cumbre core knowledge, so let me just offer some comments. Um, one of the things that I've taught to leaders across really three different school districts is the idea of due process. And I learned this from an attorney. She was teaching my team in a prior district about what due process was, and it was, it was a really short definition. Proper notification and the right to be heard. And I just paused her, because she was teaching us about expulsion things, and I just said, whoa, can you, wait, go back and repeat that. And uh, she's a good friend of mine. I said, how come you didn't teach that to me like six years earlier, because I'd known her for a long time. And that has stayed with me and guided my work um, really now for a decade plus. And so tonight is your opportunity to be heard. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to offer an apology for how the whole core knowledge thing uh, was handled, communication, the timeline, I mean, right before the transfer deadline. We recognize and we own that we should have communicated very differently, very, in a much different way. Um, and so I'm just saying due process is something that I have lived by, and I continue to hold myself accountable to, our leaders, and I always ask them the question whether it's student expulsions or, you know, programs, is there due process involved? All right, so that, I, I see head nods. That you're gonna, you get your right to speak, you know, and we look forward to your, your comments tonight. Uh, Ms. Carey and Mr. Bradley Brock is here. I asked him to be here to hear all this because uh, we need to hear from you. Okay, so again, my apologies to create undue, you know, I guess challenges at this time of signing up for school next year. You've got rising seventh graders. So I open with that offer. Um, again, we, re we look forward to receive your comments. Um, and just know that our leaders, they, we, we always try to live by that. Okay, sometimes we miss this one. All right, so due process, everyone. Proper notification, the right to be heard. And so that's so much a part of school boards that we have public comment and that you have the right to speak on any item that's on the agenda. All right, so those are my opening comments. Thank you. And now uh, to my board colleagues, any board co correspondence or comments you'd like to make? Ms. sims -Wotten. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. I just wanted to um, speak to the wonderful students and inspiring speeches that our students um, of the Poetry and Essay Contest for the Martin Luther King um, weekend. They were outstanding uh, and inspiring. They had a lot to say. As I, as I said last time, it had to do with um, the theme for this year was not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And our students really took that to heart about them not being silent about things that they are a part of, and through that, they got the courage to speak about 
how that helped them to be able to speak it and that they would not be silent. And so I appreciated that. And board members, I didn't bring it tonight, but um, they did give us a copy of all the winners and I'll make sure they're all put together in a book, a booklet. And last year, I'm not sure if it's Cami or whomever, but um, we wanted to invite some of the winners here to come and uh, um, present to the board their um, essays. So I just wanted to say that and how proud I was to, to hear each of them and that they really have a lot to say and we should be proud of them as well. Ms. Ford. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I just wanted to congratulate Ms. Sims Moten because I wasn't able to be there, but I heard that her speech um, at the Martin Luther King Jr. Um, event at Santa Barbara City College was amazing. So congratulations and thank you for representing us and the community there. I also just wanted to mention that Probably many of you had an opportunity, as I did, to enjoy the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. It's just a fantastic series of movies and events. Um, but this year, the one that impacted me the most was a documentary last Saturday called Tell My Story. And this uh, documentary details the journey of one man trying to understand his son's suicide. Uh, the, the movie is about teen suicide. He did this by spending time with lots of students, young people who had tried to commit suicide. Um, it was a, ch a chilling experience and I was really happy to see Mrs. Munoz there also. Um, but there were a few things that were revelations to me that really hit me in terms of being a, a board member for Santa Barbara Unified. Teen suicide is on the rise, 5,700 young people committed suicide last year, that was 700 more than the year before. Twice, at least twice that amount uh, attempted suicide. And every single student that he spoke to cited social media as having an impact on the way that they felt about themselves, their feelings of hopelessness, of inadequacy and lack of self-worth. And the third thing that is a revelation for me is that no amount of academic achievement is going to be as significant as um, us tackling and addressing this particular issue if we don't join together with parents um, as educators and try to address this, which has already impacted our own community a number of times. Uh, so just to let you know, the Facebook page that can tell you more about this documentary, which will be expanded on um, and I think it has some edits still to go, and then it will be available for general dis, uh, distribution. Is called ChooseLife.org. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. Okay. Yes, and as as Ms. Ford said, you know, it was nice to see her there, and for both of us to be there present and he, uh, watching this movie of um, Tell My Story. Um, Jason Reed, the father who was impacted and helped organize this, uh, invited us and was very uh, inclusive. He showed, it, the movie showed how it affects students from all walks, walks of life and also the diversity. Um, and they highlighted they had um, a psychiatrist there, uh, Mark Goldston, who answered questions afterwards. And it was very, uh, very honest, very knowledgeable and highlighted the uh, Suicide Prevention Center line. Um, that's part of the D.D. Hirsch uh, Center in, in Los Angeles. So it was very, you know, um, I'm very appreciative for, to Roger Durling, the director of the um, film festival in having this happen. And I also was able to go to attend a portion of the Martin Luther King celebration at Santa Barbara City College, where, you know, Miss Wendy Sims Moten and my fellow um, board member Dr. Reed uh, were, was present, um, excellent, you know, very nice, and afterwards there was a community celebration there at City College. Um, so, you know, um, just speaking of diversity and, and the um, significance of this for our young people and for everyone in the community to gather. Okay, Dr. Reed. All right, short but sweet. Um, what were those two words, Ms. sims Martin, that you... Uncommon courage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted you to say it again because it was so passionate. Uncommon courage. We all need uncommon courage. And, um, and that theme and your message was very powerful. And it was, um, 
it was really um, an honor to be there to hear you speak. Um, and that's all I'm going to say. Okay, thank you. Just speaking of correspondence, I wanted to thank everybody, uh, those who are here and those who wrote in um, uh, about the topic that I think many, we'll have many speakers today, but especially the students who wrote in. It's really a wonderful thing to hear from students and to hear the details in their emails about their experience and their, um, their passions and commitments. And so as the board, we do represent uh, the people, the students, teachers, parents, and so please know that your correspondence to us is read and, and also very much appreciated. So thanks for being here and thanks to those of you who wrote in. I really appreciate it. Okay, with that, I will turn it to Dr. Reed. All right, um, we have quite a few public comments, but as Mr. Matsuoka has stated, the important thing about our meeting is due process and the allowance of public comment. We have over 14 um, in, uh, to speak to uh, the issues of the core knowledge um, challenge that we face these last few days. And so I would like to acknowledge though that I would like to give the full three minutes to each participant. But I would also like to suggest that if you are hearing sort of the same similar comment that you have stated, that you might um, you know, cut your response back to just the key highlights of that so that we don't have um, a continual of the same message. Though I do want to express, it is really important that you express what you feel and what you want us to hear. So with that said, I'm going to start off with the first three. Um, we have two additional public uh, comments. So you have three minutes. You'll get a 30-second warning, and um, we will move forward. So. We have the first person is Alma Rangel, then we have Caroline Abate, and then we have uh, Declan Hurley. Buenas noches, miembros del Consejo de Educación del Distrito Escolar Unificado de Santa Bárbara. Mi nombre es Alma Rangel y vengo en representación de los DILACs e ILACs de nuestras escuelas. Good evening, board members of the Santa Barbara Unified School District Board of Education. My name is Alma Rangel and I am here representing the members of the DILAC and ILACs. Nosotros tenemos una carta eh, petición sobre el nuevo superintendente. We have a letter here which contains a petition with regards to the new superintendent. Por medio de la presente, queremos saludarlos y enviarles nuestros mejores deseos para que este año que comienza esté lleno de logros. Through this letter, we would like to greet you all and express our best wishes for this new year so that it may, so that it may be full of successes. La función que desempeñan como miembros del Consejo de Educación es muy importante, pues toda decisión tomada significa un profundo impacto en los estudiantes de nuestro distrito. Your role as school board members is very important, as every decision you make has pr a profound impact on students in our district. Los que suscribimos esta carta queremos agradecer de manera muy especial la oportunidad que nos dan de poder compartir nuestras ideas y opiniones sobre la nueva selección del superintendente. Those of us who have signed on to this letter would like to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share our ideas and opinions regarding the selection of our new superintendent. Como ustedes saben, Santa Bárbara cuenta con una amplia comunidad latina. Y el 60% de los estudiantes del distrito son latinos, por lo que existe una serie de necesidades muy específicas que anhelamos cubrir. As you all know, Santa Barbara has a large Latino community, and 60% of our district's students are Latino. And for that reason, there are a series of needs that we would like to discuss. Consideramos de suma importancia que la persona seleccionada cuente con una personalidad empática, que posea un carácter amable, sea accesible y tenga una actitud de disponibilidad y sociabilidad, 
que esté dispuesto a trabajar para combatir la desigualdad e injusticias dentro de las escuelas, sin olvidar la humildad, la humildad que debe de caracterizar a un buen líder. We believe it is very important that the person who is selected as our new superintendent be empathetic, have a kind spirit, be accessible, open and approachable, someone who is willing to work on combating inequality and injustice within our schools, someone who is humble, a characteristic that all great leaders should have, someone who is dedicated, committed and willing to take on new ideas, Alguien que sea dedicado, que esté dispuesto a emprender nuevas ideas y que cuente con un carácter inspirador hacia los demás. And someone who is inspirational in how they treat others. En cuanto a su experiencia profesional, sería óptimo contar con alguien que conozca y haya trabajado con una comunidad similar a la nuestra. With regard to their professional experience, it would be ideal to have someone who is familiar with and has worked in a community similar to ours. Una persona con experiencia en comunidades multilingües, multiculturales, y que valore la importancia de los estudios étnicos, así como con conocimiento muy amplio sobre educación especial. Someone who has experience with multilingual and multicultural communities, and who values the importance of ethnic studies, as well as someone who has extensive knowledge about special education. Alguien que sepa y entienda verdaderamente las necesidades de todos los grupos, para que pueda distribuir adecuadamente los recursos. Someone who truly understands the needs of all groups of students, so that the funds can be properly distributed. Un dirigente habilitado para trabajar con comunidades de inmigrantes. A leader who is truly prepared to work with immigrant communities. Por último, Proponemos que pudieran contemplar a un candidato bilingüe, inglés-español, inmerso en la tecnología, que tenga un pensamiento moderno, organizacional y que esté comprometido con la competencia cultural. Lastly, we propose that you consider a candidate who is bilingual in English and Spanish, someone who knows technology very well, is someone who is a modern thinker, organized, and who is committed to supporting cultural competency. Agradecemos de antemano el tiempo y atención que le puedan dar a las sugerencias planteadas, ya que para nosotros son valores importantes a favor del éxito de nuestra comunidad estudiantil de Santa Bárbara. We thank you in advance for your time and attention toward the suggestions we have presented here today, because for us, these are very important values that we feel are necessary in order for our community of students to be successful in Santa Barbara. En este momento les van a distribuir la carta para que la tengan en sus manos y está firmada por los representantes de ILAX de nuestras escuelas. Muchos de ellos están aquí. So at this moment we will distribute copies of letters for all of you and we have also uh, here the information of the people who have signed on and many of them are present here today. Muchas gracias, buenas noches. Thank you very much, have a good evening. Hi, I'm here to talk about um, a topic not related to the core or the um, core classes. So thank you for allowing me to speak about the new sexual education programs for Santa Barbara's public junior high schools. These curriculums and classroom materials contain sexually explicit pictures and ideas, completely inappropriate learning materials and student activities. Children as young as 11 years old, who may be in the seventh grade, will learn, among many things, that abortion is acceptable and that they can become one of many different genders. The reality is, these curriculums put offensive and self-destructive ideas into the minds of children that they would never think of doing on their own. As a society, we must be extremely careful what kind of thoughts we are putting into the hearts and minds of our children. Because how we behave 
and act is the direct result of what we are thinking. Schools are public places just like anywhere else in our community and should not teach, have discussions or activities that would be considered against the law in any other public place. The teacher's guide contains the following extremely disturbing idea. Infants, children, teens, and adults are sexual beings. Add and that the teacher's job is to normalize and to reduce discomfort when talking about these topics. And remember these statements are given in the context of sex education lessons. No one in good conscience can ignore what is happening here. There is a terrible agenda in these curriculums to destroy social norms and standards of behavior while, no, while mention of religion is forbidden. Everyone needs to think very carefully about the long-term consequences of these programs. You can see and read things for yourself on Wednesday, January 29th, at Santa Barbara Junior High School from 6 to 7 seconds. from 6 to 7:30 p.m. These curriculums are in our schools because of Democrat legislation as the voting record indicates. Every Democrat, including Hannah Beth Jackson, supported this law. Please stop voting for Democrats. Democrat Monique Limon has been endorsed by Hannah Beth Jackson. Please do not vote for Monique Limon. Only vote for Republican candidates who Thank would you. never allow this in our schools. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to listen. Hello. My name is Declan Hurley, and I am in sixth grade at Monroe Elementary School. I think that we should keep the core knowledge program indefinitely, because if it was canceled, I would have it in seventh and eighth grade, but the class behind me would not. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, a big part of the eighth grade core knowledge program is to mentor the seventh graders. If it was canceled, then me and the rest of the eighth grade at Lacumbra would not have a chance to do that. I'm very excited about being in core knowledge and I hope my little brother has a chance to do that too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speakers are Stephanie Poole, Bob Landegger, and Angel Hernandez. Uh, last night we were relieved to hear that core knowledge program will remain in place. However, I hear, I'm here to voice my concern about the system, systemic secrecy behind this debacle. I'm not sure who is to blame for this latest fiasco, Mr. Brock or his senior district administration, but it's suspiciously reminiscent of last year's attempt to water down the gate magnet program. District leadership should practice what they preach about social emotional learning and human connection when clearly they can't openly engage the public they serve in a respectful, empathetic, transparent, and honest manner. Social emotional learning starts with security and blindsiding us mid-year without warning does not make students feel secure. The district seems focused on the concept of structural equity in education, but it should not come at the expense of academic rigor. The LCAP annual update identifies an important strategy in closing gaps in achievement is increasing access to advanced courses in secondary schools. But ending a program like Core Knowledge would be the opposite of the strategy. Immersive academic programs like Core Knowledge should be creatively expanded and tailored to a spectrum of learning styles. 
The CK program at Coomber Junior High has been uniquely responsible for attracting neighborhood students back to this school for the past 17 years with demonstrable results. An ironic quote from uh, Superintendent Matsuoko states, the recent successes of some of the schools in the district come after a period of many years, continuity of leadership, persistence, and a lot of hard work. Culture takes years to build. You can't just copy culture from one school to another. It takes relationships, it takes time, it, it takes dedicated leadership and trust. The uh, Santa Barbara School District will be hiring a new superintendent this year, and I implore this board to prioritize transparency and seek candidates of the high personal integri integrity with a focus on academic rigor. Not a wannabe politician or ladder climbing, jargon slinging, smooth talkers. 30 seconds. It's time to codify that new district staff cannot make any sweeping pedagogical changes in their first year and without due process. There should be data, there should be public engagement, and there should be, at minimum, a plan. Thank you. Thank you. So after Bob Landegger, we have Angel Hernandez and Elvia Hernandez. Boy, I was hoping to go a little later to gather my thoughts here, um, sort of making it up as I go. Um, big supporter of the CK and the value that it's brought to my family. I would tremendously like to see it move forward. I think the thing that uh, I'd like to hear spoken to is I think there will kind of be additional information brought forward is that there was an email chain going around that says, you know, you need to go here because of this and some of the language and the tone uh, was a little uncomfortable for me. And I kind of question the transparency and the uncommon courage. And that's an unfortunate thing that I'm not sure is coming forth or from the side that I'm on or somebody else. There's, there's, there's posturing and pivoting. And I don't find that to be helpful. And so I, I do think you're here for a good time, not a long time, because like the presentation started that we're conducting ourselves with uncommon courage speaking in public is worse than death <laughs> and um, I am a believer in uh, transparency but in just the matrix of achievement either the system works or it doesn't and if it can be demonstrated that it doesn't then yeah I think it needs to get kicked to the side of the road and if it does, then it needs to be robustly supported and endorsed um, unequivocally and strongly and vocally. And I would think that also that when these type of things come out, because I'm frankly unclear to me and it's more of a question, is that when your opinions come out, is, that it's, uh, is it fully endorsed by everybody or not? It's those things that happen behind closed door sessions, which is an important component of coming to decisions. Um, but then it's a question of how fully that's spoken to. That I'm uncomfortable to say it, but I'm gonna find a way to say it, and you may not agree with it. And if you can all just sort of operate on that principle, that would work for me. Um, I do appreciate the comment at the beginning on being tone deaf. I'm a member of that club on occasion. And so that kind of levels the, the playing field. Seconds. You create an opportunity. Lastly, I would like to say is that uh, on a different subject, I do think we are all born differently and with who we are. And I think it would be tragic not to recognize in any way that we are different. Um, to some comments that were made previously. And uh, I think on that, it's just really a matter thank of what you. question of uh, what side of history you want to go down on. Anyhow, thank you. Thank you.
Hello, um, my name is Angel Hernandez, and I'm being accompanied by Eddie Lugo, an alumni from Santa Barbara, uh, I mean, La Cumbra Junior High. And we are here to show the petitions that we got. We got over 500 petitions from... We got around 500 petitions from parents, students, alumni, and community members in under a week. So, and yeah, thank you. Madam President, Madam President, um, Angel is one of the poetry and the essay contest winners for the Martin Luther King. Oh, so. excellent. Wonderful. Congratulations. Hello, my name is Elvia Hernandez, and I am the mother of Angel Hernandez. Um, I think the word of the day is truth. I have heard this word more than once in every meeting I have attended in the past 13 days. Parents have lost trust in the school system. To lose trust in something or someone is horrible feeling. But what is more horrifying is when parents are asked to trust the system with, um, with their most precious treasure, their child's education. Unfortunately, this is not the first time I have question school administration decisions, but I have not said anything because I was raised not to question authority. But that ends now. It doesn't mean people in power are right or know it all. I have witnessed many injustices, and rather than raising my voice or saying something, I have decided to deal with the situation by either transferring my kids to different schools or try to manage the issues without getting my kids hurt in the process or upsetting school officials. I can, I can keep doing this. Um, not when I see how school administration keeps getting away with careless decisions. Yes, I said careless because it is easier to get rid of programs rather than to add programs. I understand that this is just a job for many and I get that less work is always nice. I understand that not many have the passion to go above and beyond the regular duties. But at the same time, for the same reason, we must let those that have that passion keep going with their amazing dedication instead of putting obstacles or eliminating great programs. We should be supporting those great teachers and their programs unconditionally. We know that in, we know that in a good job, the employees do not fail. Rather, the leader is who fails because good leadership is passed and making their employees great. I don't know if this is our case. We might not have a strong leader. We might not have a school district employees that just, we might have just school district employees that just don't care. Either way, I'm concerned and wonder uh, what we need to do to see a change. I'm speaking up today because I cannot just continue to see programs being removed over and over again. <clears throat> I'm speaking up because my job as a parent is for my son to receive the best education possible, an education that will help his dreams and accomplish anything he sets his mind to. This is my job, and I wonder if in some way that is supposed to be the school administration's jobs too. Just as, I, just as you have done evaluations, me as a parent, and throughout seconds. the years, I have done mine. And the school district, in my results, show me they have failed. We, not, um, we would not be here today if that was not the situation. They have failed and lost the trust of many parents, students who are present today. Thank you. Thank you. So our next three speakers are Claire Fackler, Brian Johnson, and Bruce Hickey. Claire, you're good. Okay, thank you. Yep, my name is Claire Fackler. I'm a full-time working mom. I'm an active parent volunteer at Adams Elementary School. Live in the Samarkand neighborhood for the last 14 years. Very proud that our local neighborhood school has made a massive turnaround and is a very desirable place to have your child get an education. So I have a current fifth grader in the Adams Montessori program. And we were very much looking forward to exploring all of our options for junior high, but very much considering the core knowledge program at Lacumber Junior High, and that we could be a part of the success or continued success of that local neighborhood junior high. So I feel it's important to keep programs like core knowledge uh, available to students. 
And if you're not aware, Adams Montessori, the upper elementary Montessori, is a clear feeder program to core knowledge. In the last couple of years, I believe all sixth graders leaving um, Adams Montessori, all but maybe two, has continued on to core knowledge. So that seems to be a nice feeder program. And I want to also share that it makes sense that core knowledge would be evaluated, as would any program in the community um, related to education. As it continues to be evaluated, I firmly believe that uh, the board and the administration should be completely transparent and have really strong communication with the parent, parent community and, sorry, the parents and the community at large. Now on a second quick topic, I did want to share that in terms of the new superintendent search, I'm in absolute support of hoping that our school board and the team will look to some of our very local, uh, extremely talented individuals. For example, Dr. Amy Alzina. I hope she's considered as an appropriate candidate. Um, Dr. Alzina has proven herself in our local community as a successful leader over and over again at Adams Elementary School and now at Cold Springs Elementary. She's an exceptional local candidate that should be considered uh, for application, and she knows our community's needs, our students' needs, and she has the drive and stamina to take Santa Barbara Unified School District to the next level. So I hope you consider her as a, a candidate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to keep the comments moving, if we could have people line up and just be waiting, the three that I lead, uh, leave, uh, call, excuse me, first, and second and third. And finally, there are going to be no more public slips. We were closing down the public comment for now. So um, moving forward, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm the parent of an um, alumni as well as a current student, and I wanted to speak on uh, in support of continuing the CK program. I wanted to start by thanking you, the, uh, the board, the district, as well as the administration for reversing the decision to continue the program. Um, I think that, um, or I, I believe that one of the reasons that this happened so quickly was because of the students uh, in the core knowledge program. I think that this is evidence of why the program should continue because of their ability to mobilize um, and, and the lessons that they learned through their classes has given them the, you know, the desire to learn uh, and, and the willingness to put themselves out there in support of a program like this. So I wanted to thank the parents and the students for that. Um, I did also want to speak on what I believe has been said and will continue to be said. There appears to be a lack of transparency, uh, communication, and due process. The original communication that we received seemed to make, it, um, make us believe that the decision had been made over a period of a few weeks from November to January. And then the latest communication today that we received uh, seems like this has been in process for 18 months. So it would be really helpful if what could come out of this whole process is some real evidence and facts about what went into making the de decision. Was this a recent decision that was made or was this something that's been on the table for a long time? Who was involved in it? Um, why weren't the parents in the core knowledge program uh, asked to be involved in it? And if they were, who was involved in it? I, I don't believe any of us were because we've been at this uh, school for the past three years and this was the first time we heard about it uh, in January. So there's still a lot of, I think, questions out there as far as the uh, decision-making process that went into place. Um, and I think it would be very beneficial for regaining the trust of the parents moving forward if that could be examined and if that could be shared. And then if we can all be brought in for any decisions in the future, because the students and the parents really do know that program the best. So thank you. Thank you. Again, we have Bruce Hickey, then we have Olga Jones, and then Kristen Shee. If we could line up here next to the speaker so that we can be moving a little more quickly. Thank you. Good evening. This is my second appearance at the school board meeting in the last year, and a pattern is repeating. Administration, administrators are surprising parents with dramatic policy changes and acted without consultation, and in doing so, they also loudly announce, it's our decision. Whoever's, whoever's rolling it out, I hear this over and over, it's my decision, I did this, nobody else was responsible. There's something, it's very odd. The, the board has heard a timeline 
of the evolving and contradictory explanations to end, then postpone, and now reinstate the core knowledge program. I'd like to address both the culture of secrecy and the demonstrated lack of leadership. Our child attended the Lacumbre Junior High Open House on January 9th and was basically lied to about the programs and the direction of the school. The depth of those lies is still emerging with new information coming out yesterday, and I think that's shameful. We now know these changes were conceived before Principal Brock was hired. Principal Brock's statements related to this decision always clearly included the words, I own this decision. It appears, the di but however, it appears the district is setting the agenda, directing the staff to ram it through via deception instead of consultation, and leaving the staff to take the responsibility for the fallout. I was taught that the core tenet of leadership is to be out in front to take responsibility and to own the decisions made by your team, especially the bad ones. Until tonight, the district was providing none of that. Principal Brock is left to clean up the mess initiated by his superiors. I think it's important for the board to be alerted to the culture of secrecy and political cover that has been on clear display these last few weeks. In my world, leadership like this is quickly replaced. Our family is excited to be attending Lacumbre Junior High, be part of the community, support public schools and their staff. We're not going to stop fighting for transparency and accountability. Our energy could be put to much better use supporting the school, its principal, and our kids. My request is that the board recognize the weaknesses on display here and guide the recruitment process for new superintendent to have the ability and the fortitude to enact changes in a constructive way. Thank you. Thank you. Is it Olga Jones? Okay, and then Kristen, and then we have Deborah Feigenson. Uh, Good evening. I'm a parent um, of an alumni at Lucumber Junior High. My daughter attended Lucumber Junior High back in 2007 graduated in 2009. Um, her, numbers, uh, her number, her name's Francesca Gonzalez, and um, we found it urgent to, um, to come and speak to you all. We really love the Core Knowledge Program. She excelled exceedingly in the Core Knowledge Program, and as I believe, um, why uh, fix something that's not broken? Um, so anyways, I wanted to read to you a letter that she wrote um, to, um, for you all, she wanted me to read to you. She um, lives in LA and works in LA. Esteemed Santa Barbara Unified School District Board members and Principal Bradley Brock. It has come to my attention that there has been some thought of, to discontinue the core knowledge program at Lacombe Junior High School. I would like to take a short moment of your time to explain how this program has shaped my adolescence and ultimately affected my life today. In 2007, as I was entering my teenage years, one can imagine all the stress a young girl experiences as she moves into a bigger school with new students from all over the district. I recall a friend of my mother stressing how much fun her daughter was having in the Core Knowledge program and how close her daughter had become with everyone in the program. So I decided to enroll and give it a try. Two years had come and gone, and I became part of this school within a school that gave me an opportunity to become academically confident before high school, but most importantly, I became comfortable in my ability to feel accepted among my peers. This experience led me to enter into more programs like this, such as the Multimedia Arts and Design Academy at Santa Barbara High School, State Street Ballet Young Dancers, Santa Barbara City College Phi Theta Kappa, and my sorority at UCLA, class of 2017. After college, I realized the importance of finding a job that has the same close-knit company culture, where ideas can be shared freely without judgment, and where helping one another succeed to create something great was my ideal goal. Today, I have found a wonderful job doing something that I love, where I can do just that, and I thank the Core Knowledge Program for first introducing me to an environment where everyone worked and collaborated together and had fun at the same time. I strongly believe this program can benefit kids today more than ever, and it would be an seconds. enormous loss if it were to go away. 
Thank you for your time. Sincerely, Francesca Gonzalez, La Cumbre Lancers, Class of 2009. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kristen Shee. I'm a mom of four kids who spent six years each at Santa Barbara Community Academy, which in the beginning was a core knowledge school. Also, my four kids each went two years at La Cumbra Junior High in the core knowledge program. So I am very strongly um, in support of the core knowledge. Um, <clears throat> my children, oh, I'm a mom in the medical field. I've been a, um, in the medical field for 30 years. I am also an active parent volunteer. And I'm a mother of a US Marine veteran who's now in Afghanistan. Thank you. That's where I walk. Um, who, you know, went through the core knowledge program and learned a lot about respect. And um, the core knowledge program has a, a really good academic program. But that's not what I'm here to speak about. I'm here to speak about because I personally hated my junior high experience here. But um, my children, my four children, three boys and a girl, loved it. They just loved it. And it was because they were in a group that spent a couple of periods together each day, and they learned to trust. They learned it was a safe environment to talk about frustrations, to ask questions, to just share with their, their friends and their teachers. Um, they took field trips together. They did sleepovers. They did dance. And the alumni came back. And we would volunteer or they would volunteer to attend those sleepovers. And I'm telling you, those aren't really very fun. <laughs> um, yeah, you don't get a lot of sleep on that hard floor. But it was so bonding. And my children bonded with, with kids in their classes that are, they still have the bond today. And, um, and it's because they became a family. And that was the most important part of our experience at, of Core Knowledge. Um, I also, real quickly, want to say I do support sex education in, in schools only because I've seen a lot of 12 and 13 year olds um, who are already pregnant. And um, that's just my my medical field. And then um, I can't remember what else I was going to say, but thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And after uh, we have Deborah Ferguson, then we have Francis Butler, Tyler Tomblin, and then uh, Christina Miguel. Thank you. My name is Deborah Feigenson. I'm a professor of physics at UCSB. I live at the West End of Isla Vista. And I have sent my two daughters to La Cumbre Junior High School, largely because of the Core Knowledge Program. Earlier today, I CC'd the board on an email in response to Principal Brock's letter, um, where I signaled my appreciation of his decision to continue the Core Knowledge Program and urged greater transparency in his process of identifying and rectifying inequities in the future. I came here this evening in person to emphasize the magnitude of the disaster that was just averted and to urge the board to similarly make its agenda with respect to La Cumbre more transparent. If you could share the data that elicits the kind of concerns that you have that might lead you into these types of measures, I think you'd find the La Cumbre community would come together to and feel more leveraged to improve the school rather than called to arms in its defense. I was interested in um, the superintendent's definition of due process. I didn't know what it was either, um, surprisingly, and I will keep that in mind. Proper notification and the right to be heard. It makes me think notification doesn't put a lot of burden You've come up with a decision, you inform people about it, and then they get a chance to say what they think of it. 
I urge you to go a little bit beyond what's required of you for due process. Apparently, it's not required that you share the reasoning behind your decision. But if you were to do that, or perhaps even share the information you're contemplating before coming to a decision, I think it would be easier for you to collect the kind of data that leads to good decisions. And that's all I came to say. Thank you. Thank you. So Francis Butler, Tyler Tomlin, and Christina Miguel. Hello, my name's Francis Butler. I heard and I appreciate Superintendent Matsuoka's opening state apology and his statement of support of due process. But I have to say, in the matter of core knowledge, the Santa Barbara dis the District Administration has acted with extraordinary duplicity. There's no other word. Mr. Brock's letter of January 15th announced the end of core knowledge. It was completely unexpected to parents and students, in spite of claims that it involved the entire school community. In the letter and in subsequent comments at coffee with the principal, Mr. Brock indicated that he made the decision personally over an eight-week period, and he took full responsibility for it. During coffee with the principal, Assistant Superintendent Sean Carey stood by and looked sympathetic to, towards parents. She also talked about rebuilding trust at some length. Mr. Brock's email of January 27th yesterday gave completely different reasons than his letter of January 15th for the closing of core knowledge. It indicated that the closure of core knowledge was an 18-month process that began before he was hired. In other words, the process began immediately after Joanne Kane's death. If I understand correctly, the only two links in the administrative chain between Mr. Brock and the school board are Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education Sean Carey and Superintendent Carey Matsuoka. Assistant Superintendent Carey has shown no honesty. She lies and orders subordinates to lie. Sorry, it's true. Let's, let's keep no. things respectful, sir, please. Thank let's you. keep things respectful. I respectfully say that she lies. No decency. She listens with a caring expression and talks about wanting to rebuild trust, even as she is engaged in deceit. No respect for students. She does not care about a wonderful chip program in a school for which she was responsible last year. She is secretive. She deliberately plots behind the scenes with absolutely no student or parent input. No respect for parents. No interest in education. She has attempted to destroy a great program instead of supporting it. I would like to ask the board to remove this arrogant. Excuse me, sir. No personal, no personal attacks, I apologize. Please. I would like to ask the board to remove this person from her extremely powerful position in the district as soon as possible. Second point, less aggressive. Recent events have already done damage to the core knowledge program. 30 seconds. Uh, there, this could cause low enrollments next year. The vagueness of the most recent parent square message from Mr. Brock suggests the possibility of a continuing plan to eliminate core knowledge. I hope that isn't true, and I hope that what you've heard tonight, that what we've heard tonight will help to make that not true. And I'd love to say positive things. I'd love to say wonderful things, but I'd like to ask, please, don't just reinstate the core knowledge program. Try to protect it Thank if it you. has trouble. Thank you. So Tyler Tomlin, Christina Miguel, and then Jill Rivera. Good evening, Board of Education, Superintendent, and all that are in, t in attendance tonight. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, this speech is not about core knowledge. Uh, that speech is in your inbox. The speech entitled tonight is, Oops, I Did It Again, uh, SBUSD's response to the community outcry. Um, it has been wrongly assumed that last night's letter by Principal Brock would somehow appease us. I have spent over a week strategizing, organizing, listening to, and preparing a distraught community. Last night, it felt like the rug had been pulled out from under my feet once again. Was this an attempt to cause disarray and chaos among us? We still haven't received the answers that we asked. We still have no answers to our questions. You see, the district has it all wrong. It's not enrage parents, it's engage parents. And only when you enrage us do you engage us. It's shameful that SB 
USD has been caught yet again, culpable of lies and bad decisions surrounding public policy, lack of stakeholder input, and poorly implemented plans. School board, I implore you, during the search for a new superintendent, reflect on these embarrassing mistake, mistake, uh, missteps in our recent past. I only want what is right for my children, period. They have the right to feel safe walking to, from, and at school, and they have a right to a rigorous education that meets their needs. It should, shouldn't matter where you live, whether you own a car, the money you earn, or the color of your skin. Equality should be not be dependent on your learning ability or social economic status. The public schools need to encompass all demographics and mirror our society as a whole. Some schools need more resources and better programs to balance the challenges caused by the Every Student Succeed Act, Succeeds Act. Parent communication and community perception are key. It is in my opinion that this is one of the best places in the world to live and our public schools shouldn't be failing us. Thank you. Thank you. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Cristina Miguel. Good evening. My name is Cristina Miguel. Tengo una estudiante en la Escuela La Cumbre en el octavo grado. Ella está en Core Knowledge. I have an eighth grader who's in Core Knowledge at La Cumbre Junior High School. Uh, solamente vengo a decir que el programa de Core Knowledge ha beneficiado mucho a mi niña. I just wanted to come and say that Core Knowledge has really benefited my daughter. Uh, todos los días desde que ella empezó la escuela en el prekinder en la escuela Adams, todos los días yo eh, me comunico con ella, platico con ella, ¿cómo te va en la escuela? So every day since she started school in prekinder at Adams, I have checked in with her. I ask her, how did it go? How was your day? Y yo he notado que en estos uh, dos años en Cornoles, ella empezó siendo una niña un poco muy tímida uh, cuando entró a la junior high por los cambios y uh, nuevos compañeros. And so I noticed that when she started at the school two years ago, she was a little shy because of all the changes going on at that time and because she had new schoolmates. Y ahora veo el cambio totalmente diferente de mi niña todo lo que me platica está interesada en muchos temas y pienso que todo eso es gracias al programa de Cornolish. And now I see the total opposite. She's very engaged, she's very interested in everything that she has learned and I think a big part of that is because of Cornolish. Pienso que lejos de quitar un buen programa, pienso que lejos de quitar un buen programa en la escuela, hay que ver ¿Cuál es lo que se necesita mejorar más en la escuela La Cumbre? So I think before removing a great program at the school, we must look at what can we do to improve the programs at La Cumbre. Se tienen que, pienso que hay que mejorar otras áreas en La Cumbre y eso es lo que pienso que al nivel del distrito se tiene que ver no solamente en La Cumbre, sino en todas las escuelas. And I think that we need to improve other areas of La Cumbre, and that's something that we as a district need to look at, and not just at La Cumbre, but in other schools. Uh, yo he atendido otros, uh, otras juntas aquí y siempre se ha dicho, y en las escuelas también, que es más del 60% de los estudiantes latinos a nivel del distrito. So I've been to quite a few meetings here at the district and also at the schools, and we've always heard that more than 60% of the students in the district and in the schools are Latino. El programa de Core Knowledge no este, distingue a nadie, es un programa que incluye a todos. Uh, core Knowledge is a program that does not discriminate against anybody, it includes everybody. Ah, en este programa de Core Knowledge hay más latinos estudiantes que estudiantes blancos. In this program, Core Knowledge, there are more Latino students than white students. Entonces yo pienso que tenemos que seguir beneficiando a la comunidad latina que va creciendo uh, con el tiempo. And so I think that we need to continue supporting the Latino community, which is growing. Y hablando sobre el apoyo a los latinos, quiero uh, mencionar a la persona que a mí me gustaría que ocupara el lugar de superintendente. And with regards to supporting our Latino community, I would also like to share a few words with regards to the search for the new superintendent. 
Y me quiero dirija, eh, dirigir a ustedes el, la mesa directiva del distrito escolar, uh -huh. a las personas uh, de DILAC y a los representantes de ILAT que están aquí sentados. And I would like to address you, the members of the Board of Education here at Santa Barbara Unified, and also to the DILAC and ELAC representatives that are here present. Pienso que es tiempo para un cambio en nuestro liderazgo. Y yo sugiero que espero que sea una mujer la que dirija el Distrito Escolar de Santa Bárbara. And I do believe that it is time that we have changes in our leadership. And I hope that our next superintendent could perhaps be a woman. Mi candidata ha trabajado mucho con los latinos. Ella no habla español, pero ha trabajado muchísimo con nosotros los latinos. My preferred candidate uh, does not speak Spanish, but she has worked very well with Latinos. Impulsó mucho el programa de ELAC en la escuela Adams. She really supported the ELAC program at Adams. Ella empezó ese programa con una uh, mamá obviamente latina. She began that program with a Latina mother. Mi niña, cuando yo empecé, ah, cuando ella empezó en la escuela Adams, la escuela Adams estaba en números rojos, porque yo busqué, ah, estaba buscando una escuela magnet, que es lo que mi familia en Los Ángeles me recomendaba. So when my daughter started at Adams, it was in the red. I was looking for a magnet school because when I was living in LA, that's what everybody would recommend. Y entonces, casi puedo decir que yo tuve la experiencia de cómo la escuela Adams creció, cuando lo dirigía la doctora, la ahora doctora Emmy Alcina. So I can honestly um, share my experience with regards to how much Adam's school grew under the direction of now Dr. Amy Alcina. 30 seconds. Siempre apoyó todos nuestros programas. She always supported all of our programs. Y siempre empujó el programa de ELAC. And she always supported ELAC. Cuando terminó, uh, cuando ella se retiró de la escuela Adams, eh, la escuela terminó con, eh, con el sello de una escuela distinguida. When she left Adams, Adams received uh, the seal of a distinguished school. Y bueno, tengo que volverlo a repetir. No necesitamos una persona que hable nuestra lengua, el español. Thank you. Thank you very much. Para que nos pueda ayudar y entender a nosotros los latinos. So I would say that we don't necessarily need someone who speaks Spanish in order to work and understand Latinos. Muchas Thank gracias. You. Thank you. Thank you. Our last two speakers, Jill Rivera and Patricia Lopez. Jill Rivera, next. And Patricia Lopez. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Jill Rivera, and my th I have three boys, and they all went to uh, Roosevelt Elementary for their elementary school years. When I was looking for a junior high school for my two older boys, I looked at all the schools, and we chose Lucumber Junior High. And the reason we chose Junior Lucumber Junior High, even though none of my children's friends went to Lucumber Junior High, and a lot of my friends thought it was crazy, um, was because um, of the core knowledge program. And there seems to be a push to kind of move in the direction of one size fits all. And I'd just like to remind the district and the board that children are individuals, and they all have different needs. And, you know, as we can see, um, you know, superintendents, the average tenure is three to five years. And yet the decisions they make affect all of us for years after their departure. And our community as stakeholders, I think we should have a say in what kinds of programs uh, remain or are evaluated. So my kids both went to, <laughs> to the core knowledge program. In fact, that's how I met Wendy. Because Wendy and I were actually on an overnight train to Venice together because we were chaperones when core knowledge took the kids to Europe. That was pretty crazy. <laughs> I said, if I, could, if I could sleep standing up, I would do it. But anyway, we had an absolute blast. The teachers were amazing. My kids were immersed in a diverse culture, met kids they would have never met. I met Wendy, which was a plus. And that program was absolutely fantastic. Um, I, have, I have a journal that my son 
uh, made. Now, of course, he's a he's a technical artist at Sony now, but in his beginning years, we went to the Sistine Chapel, and we went with Core Knowledge, and my son has beautiful sketches of the Sistine Chapel, of uh, Notre Dame, you name it. It's the most precious thing, and that would not have happened without that program. So I'm really happy to hear that the program remains, but again, um, you know, all the stakeholders, and what, you know, I said about what would I like to see happen? Can we just come together as a as a community and have an open dialogue and a partnership and make decisions that are mutually beneficial, not top down. Um, you know, kids are individuals and they all have different needs and that's why seconds. they're different programs. And I just think that we should keep that in mind and also listen to the parents, you know. We're the ones paying the taxes and showing up and volunteering, you name it. So, yeah, great. <laughs> Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Patricia Lopez, and I actually just came uh, briefly. I had a lot of parents who asked me to go ahead and give my personal opinion on core knowledge. And on a personal note, my uh, son, who's in 10th grade now, he was the graduating class that had to learn the day of their promotion and that their beloved Mrs. Keynes had passed away. And so when I told my son the news about the core knowledge, um, the first question he asked is that, why? And I said, exactly, why? It's a program that I think um, has really grown on my son. He still has his two buddy boxes that they had to do in class. Um, <laughs> he remembers, um, other than, of course, the carpe diem, the winter formal, the dances they had to learn, but just engaging with the students and doing sketches and performing and just seeing him grow um, in that program, um, and for them to say that is just for certain types of students, I believe it's hits personal because I think Lacumba Junior High, and especially when Mrs. Kane was there, she loved how her students and worked very, very hard to be inclusive of all students, regardless of what academic level they were at. On a personal note as well, um, I have been in many uh, PTA president at Monroe School. My son's a sixth grader. I've been in the ELAC committee and the DLAC committee and the parent advisory committee. Um, you name it, any committee that um, the school at Monroe has asked me to be part of, I have, even at Lacumber Junior High. Um, I've tried to be involved as much as I can. Um, I know my son um, would be here, but he's actually at home doing his homework <laughs> um, because that's one thing that the program at Lacumber Junior High installed him was responsibility, integrity, respect, and above all, teamwork. And I think those are qualities that kids need to learn within an environment, and I think that's what the core knowledge provided. So I hope you guys really reconsider and um, extend it uh, for permanent. That would be great. Uh, like I said, my son's in sixth grade, and um, he was looking forward to being part of the community in within the core knowledge program and the Cumber itself. I just have to say that the staff and the teachers have gone above and beyond at that school. Um, when I've needed it the most on a personal level for my son, I just have to say that. So thank you very much for your time. And once again, I really hope that you consider to keep the Core Knowledge Program in, at La Cumbre Junior High because it's an inclusive of all students. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Uh, that concludes uh, public comment for this evening. Thank you all for uh, being here and sharing your um, your comments with our with the board. Yes, thank you. So now we will move on to the next item on the agenda. It's uh, item D, which is the acceptance of donations. I move that we accept with gratitude donations for January 28, 2020. Second. Sec okay. Ms. Ford seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, next, consent agenda, item E. Do any of uh, board members have any items they'd like to pull from the consent agenda? No? OK. Let's take a motion. Motion so moved. to <laughs> Please. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, moving right along here. We have um, item F, 
action agenda. Dr. Reed. Yes, in the case of 2019-20-17. Excuse me, if you don't mind um, uh, just en exiting a little more quietly. Thank you. In the case of 2019-20-17, I move to make the motion for a stipulated agreement for expulsion with enforcement suspended for two semesters which end June 2020. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. In the case of 2019-20-29, I move to make the motion for a stipulated agreement for full expulsion for two semesters which end in June 2020. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Or second. second. Aye. Aye. I'm sorry. Second. <laughs> sorry, I jumped the gun. <laughs> Ms. Ford has a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, moving on to readmission. In the case of 2018-19-11, I move to make a motion for student reentry from full expulsion for two semesters ended in June 2019 and completed in January 2020. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. In the case of 2018-19-26, I move to make a motion for student reentry from suspended expulsion for two semesters ended in January 2020. Second. So moved. I mean... Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And in the case of 2018-19-33, I move to make the motion for student re-entry from suspended expulsion for two semesters ended in January 2020. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Dr. Reed. And now we move to item F6. Uh, that is the approval of the agreement with McPherson and Jacobson to provide recruitment services for our next superintendent. Brian, do you mind pulling that contract up? So this is a, um, a chance for the board to ask any questions and make any potential changes to uh, this contract. Do you want me to, anything that stood out that you had a question about? I'm, I worked it out with them and Sandra and I did. And the one key piece I just want to note at the bottom, if you don't mind, Mr. Rouse, is that we did put, as discussed in their pitch, um, a maximum amount, mm -hmm. but the anticipated mm -hmm. fee is twenty one nine hundred. But we did, especially given travel, I uh, wanted to make sure that that was included, not to exceed amount. Right. Okay, good. I'll just. Um, I think that's it. Without any questions or comments, um, I need a motion. All right. Uh, I just want to thank you for your work on that, and so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Great. Moving on to, let's see where I am. Uh, item seven, approval of partner provisional internship permits. Dr. Becchio. All right. Um, I have before you, and good evening, board members, by the way. Um, I have before you a um, request for approval so we can um, issue a um, provisional internship permit for a teacher who's currently um, subbing in a long-term position at La Cumbra in uh, PE. They will, uh, this person in March, we would like to move over into a um, multiple subject um, area because I think he's gonna take, take actually two uh, blocks, get a block of students. And so what we need is um, your approval on this particular item so we can send it off to the CTC. Any, yes. question, any questions or comments? I didn't have any either, so. So moved. I will Second. Move it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Dr. Becchio. Moving right along here. Uh, again, you, Dr. Dr. Becchio, item eight, approval of new certificated job descriptions. Okay, this item is in relation to um, the rollout next school year of the dual language immersion program at Santa Barbara Junior High. Um, in order to do that, um, Maria Larias Horton and, and I worked together on creating actually two job descriptions that you had in your packet. And um, I'll go through each of them just briefly so I can describe why there's two for uh, the dual language immersion program. Um, I did write it up in my introduction, but um, what you'll see is the first one is Spanish, Spanish language arts and social science dual language immersion teacher. Um, that is a teaching role where the teacher will actually have a, a block of students, so two periods, 
One will be for Spanish language arts, and then the other one will be for social science taught in dual language. Uh, you'll, you can read through that. It really does read much like a teacher's job description. And then the second one is the dual language immersion site coordinator. And what we need is um, a part of that position. So it's, a, it's really um, conceived as a, as a 1.0 FTE. Part of it will be this teacher job description, probably the first year a 40% teaching position. And then 60% of it will be this other job description, which is coordinating the rollout of the, that seventh grade year plus the following eighth grade year where we'll need curriculum and, and everything that goes along with um, a, a brand new uh, curricular program. So we, we envision that the second year there'll be a, a transfer over to 80% teaching with 20% um, needing to do some site coordinating of that uh, dual language immersion. So hence the two um, job descriptions. So what we're asking is for you to have reviewed those and um, give us input, and we're seeking your approval for those. Thank you. Any questions uh, or comments? Ms. Ford. Uh, thanks. Can you help um, me understand if you long-term envision that that job, dual language immersion site coordinator, does not have teaching responsibility? That's correct. The portion of the site coordinator position would not have teaching responsibility during that, during those periods during the day. And it would be coordinating the rollout. Okay, thanks. And I'm not sure if, um, I'll, I'll re-describe it. The first year we intend to have a 40% teaching, 60% coordinating. Second year it would roll over to 80% teaching, 20% coordinating. So second year, is there another position also? Or this person is going to teach the seventh and eighth grade blocks, so that's four periods a day. You got it. But the first year, next year, they're teaching two periods a day. That's correct. OK. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? That sounds good to me. I, oh, Dr. Reed. Yeah, I just want to comment that I think this is great. This is a exciting change and movement forward in this in this program. So um, I look forward to hearing how how it uh, evolves. Thank you. I'll just add. I, um, this is relevant, but um, got, as a parent, got one of the surveys about developing this project process, and I imagine at some point we'll be hearing about that. Correct? Yeah. Exciting. Great. Great. Yeah, and just to remind you, this is really an endeavor that has been worked on real deeply in Ed Services, and then they come to me for assistance on creating the job description. So, oh, okay, it's on the agenda for later. So you'll get more information, there more better information. <laughs> okay. With that, I need a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank motion you. Carries. Thank you. And now we'll move to item nine, uh, Mr. Vizzolini. Approval of increased architectural fees for the Monroe Elementary Portable Replacement Project. Good evening, board, Superintendent Matsuoka. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a unique um, action item, asking for an increase to our architectural services fees for a project without there being a, a matching increase in the construction cost. So I wanted to kind of walk you through this. It's been a little while with, with uh, Monroe, and I wanted to explain a little bit here. So um, at Monroe, we've had some significant design challenges. We've actually had to move the site where the buildings were going to be constructed three different times. Um, so um, each iteration has been a complete redesign by our design team. So all of their subconsultants, everything, all of the surveying work had to be done because everything got changed. Uh, I'll explain why in just a second, but I wanted to kind of preface this whole thing by that. So our professionals are asking for an increase based on the, all that extra work that they did. Um, one of them was even ready to be submitted to DSA at the time. So that's the beginning of it. So just to show you where we are, um, this is Monroe School, obviously. Um, the first site location is at the south end here where these four portables are next to the existing kindergarten building. And uh, this is the vision that we had to begin with. Um, as you see, um, we had a total of six classrooms. We had two normal-sized classrooms, two large classrooms in one block, um, and two larger-sized classrooms that are actually down on the playground area. 
Um, also notice the large paseos um, and the walkways. And so this was a, a big vision at the time to try and get some outdoor experiences, um, places for the community to gather and have some uh, an outdoor learning experience. What you can't see in this 2D drawing is the horizontal difference of grade between where the kindergarten building is and the kindergarten, it, or excuse me, and the playground. It's probably about 15 feet of change. So this, this nice looking walkway has all kinds of angles to it and it's got retaining walls. And so the amount of concrete and those types of things were significant. So these are kind of our, the challenges that we found that to, to make the Division of State Architect happy with all of our excess compliance uh, requirements. Um, the outdoor plazas being a significant amount of concrete, we actually work with a, our LLB contractor and got an estimate and it came in really high. So, you know, including moving some of this playground equipment, we were a little over $2 million over our budget. So as you can imagine, we were a little shocked at that period. Um, we did not have a very big contingency fund at that point. So we had to, we decided to reevaluate and move on. Um, <clears throat> So now we're looking at Monroe again, and we're talking about focusing on the upper corner, which is the uh, northwest corner of the campus. Uh, and this is the plan that we came here. So this we shaped it a little bit because of the confined, the confined space. They're a little bit smaller classrooms, but they're three sets of two. There's a, a shared community area. The, the staff at Monroe was very interested in having this uh, learning community. Um, but we had a major problem. So when we started doing our typical site work at the beginning, um, our geological consultants notified us that there's potential for an active fault. So um, we, we asked them to, how do we evaluate that? Well, it turns out um, it's quite an extensive project just to find out whether the fault is there um, because they don't know where it is exactly. You literally have to dig up a big, huge portion of the field and have a geologist test a bunch of areas. So the cost for that work was going to be several hundred thousand dollars, and we kind of decided that was not a great use of the money, especially when we weren't sure we wouldn't have to move the buildings again anyway. Um, the other input is from school staff. This, isn't, this wasn't the ideal location for them. It's uh, located pretty far away from the cafeteria and the office and the parking lot, and they just felt like it wasn't a great location. So going back to the drawing board, we went back to our original location, which is down here on the, uh, the southern side next to the kindergarten. Um, and this is our new um, iteration. So you'll notice that the buildings have been turned 90 degrees. Um, there are only five of them this time. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Some of the, the costs are going to go up just because of time, passage of time. But we also have two large um, upper grade classrooms, two normal classrooms, and a kindergarten and TK room is now designed into this because it's next to the existing kindergartens. So the proximity played into this. Um, so the kindergarten rooms have their own restrooms. There's also a staff restroom that has access from the outside. So all the teaching group down in this area doesn't have to hike to the office. Um, and try and deal with that. Um, they still maintain the learning community by keeping all of the rooms together in kind of a, a quad and that the school is trying to make that a multi-grade level experience. So they've got team teaching going on. You can see that the classrooms, except for the kindergarten, have a partition in the center that's, that raises and lowers. It's a glass wall. So they can isolate the rooms or they can work together as teams. Um, also in this iteration, we had to move will have to move the existing play structure. So it's actually moving closer to the kindergarten playground, which is beneficial, and that path is, will be ADA compliant. And so now we'll have all the kindergarten function tied together in the actual kindergarten yard, which we think is a pretty good idea. Um, so this is the final iteration. We're not going to be back to give you a fourth one. Um, the site staff is really very happy with this, this last layout. It actually turns out to be the one they like the most. Um, so we're, we're good about that. Um, there will be a cost impact. This, this um, agenda item is asking for the increase of $165,000 for our design team, which is all of the subconsultants too. Um, so we're asking for that as an action item tonight. Um, the construction costs we expect to go up slightly, but not at the not at the same magnitude that we saw with the first phase one, because the there's not nearly the flat work. Um, there was one thing I wanted to show you that I forgot to mention as a benefit. Um, up at the top, you see this green space. So. Um, while we moved to the other side, the school started making plans to make a garden in this area. And uh, so now that we've moved back, we moved out of that space and left it available for them. So the Audacious um, Foundation and Explore Ecology and the school staff are all extremely excited about making that an edible forest. 
Um, another benefit to that is we're removing a whole bunch of ornamental turf that just takes a bunch of water that's not sustainable. Um, and then the last piece that's really nice is there's a pre-existing outdoor space that's um, on the playground itself that's just adjacent to this garden space. And it's got, um, it's ADA compliant, it's got seating, it's got a huge tree with this giant shade canopy so they can have an outdoor experience. So, so the explore economy, or excuse me, ecology folks are very interested in turning that into an outdoor classroom to tie into this garden space. So as I was saying, uh, we will expect it to go up a little bit. The garden will not be included. That will be something that Audacious is going to fund. So it won't be in the project itself, but we'll be uh, right after it. Um, and the good news, um, you know, based on our report from last meeting, we have a very healthy contingency in Measure J. So affording this and not changing the scope again, I think, won't be a problem. So I wanted to uh, present that to you so you saw what we've been through with Monroe, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks for that thorough explanation. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Ms. Ford. Just wondering what the timeline is now once you receive our approval. Uh, plans are already being worked on. This, this is just an addition to their, the contract right. they already had. So uh, we're talking about putting this in DSA probably right at the beginning of the summer. So we're hoping toward the end of the year we can get started on construction. Thank you. Yep, Ms. Sims Moten. Uh, well, I first I want to certainly think about uh, to thank you for um, where the little kids are, putting those together, putting the play playground a little closer to them, as well as being close to the outdoor area, which is really good for for our young ones. And I also want to just thank the audacious audacious uh, audacious, audacious. audacious um, foundation for their support for for the garden. And, and I also want to appreciate the. Uh, the site folks that were, you know, very much uh, a part of this and coming to a, a very common place. So it, it's a successful place and we look forward to it getting completed. We all do. Okay. Ms. Munoz. Yes, I appreciate your um, explanation. I tried to read it and figure it out. <laughs> and my, I just had a question, uh, City College, is that on the other side of where the food forest, you know, the... Uh, no, City drive? Santa Barbara City College is across from McKinley School. This is Monroe, so oh, it's it's a little further down, okay. closer to Henry's Beach. <laughs> yes, and I and I love the you know the outdoor. Um, I mean, it's like a win-win situation. Yeah. so I appreciate. <laughs> Thank you. Great. And as a kid who went to. Uh, went to school here in portables. It's always nice to uh, replace them. So thanks. Thanks, Mr. Vizzolini. So um, we need so we an need action, action item. Yeah. Yes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Matsuoka, item 15. Oh, no, excuse me. I jumped. Item 10. Uh, Ms. Carey, approval of Santa Barbara High and Goleta Valley Junior High School's plans to school-wide. Need my glasses. Title one status. Thank you, President Caps, and good evening, board members and uh, district staff and community members. Uh, I'm here to uh, present to you, much as we did about this time last year with Dr. Rich Runhaug from San Marcos, that two uh, additional secondary sites uh, have been deemed eligible to be designated as school-wide programs for Title I funds, as opposed to targeted assistance programs. Um, and this really just has to do with the incidence of students in need who are eligible to be beneficiaries of Title I funds. Um, it allows uh, principals under the guidance and monitoring of their respective school site councils to um, expend Title I funds, as the name conveys, school-wide, as, as opposed to needing to ensure that only students who have been identified as Title I students um, are the beneficiaries of those funds. So um, it does require board approval. Um, it also requires school site council approval. And so this, this request is coming to you having already been, been vetted by the respective school councils and, by, and, and having been approved by them. Um, I want to uh, commend uh, Dr. Simmons and Mr. Ortega for being here tonight, um, for having put together very detailed um, rationale in the form of the attached memos about, uh, about uh, how how their their vision and their school site council vision of expending these funds will look. Um, and then also you have copies of the minutes just to attest to the school site council process. Um, so I think if there are any very specific questions about their intents for expenditure, certainly they're on hand to be able to, to answer and respond to those. Um, and if there are any questions about just, you know, how these sh shifts work for schools, 
moving from targeted assistance to school-wide programs, we can, we can try to respond to those as well. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Any questions or comments? Ms. sims -Milton. Yes, could you expand on just what you just said in terms of what those shifts, what that actually means? Mm -hmm. so, um, so there can be misconceptions about what it means to be a Title I student, and really it's a student who's at risk of, of not meeting standard for the grade level. Um, and so there can be lots of overlap between socioeconomically disadvantaged youth, um, youth who have other um, special learning needs that might be distinct from just a, a, a at grade level student. Um, but and so, but, but what can be confusing is in annual reports, and Mr. Rouse can correct me if I'm wrong, because he's one of the people who helps us generate these reports and can kind of see as we cross over thresholds in terms of eligibility, um, socioeconomic status or proportion of the student body that is, I believe it's 40% is the threshold of SED, that a school as a whole has to, has to cross over in order to sort of be examined for Title I eligibility school-wide. So even though that's used as an indicator, um, it's important to remember that Title I funds are designated for helping students at risk of not being at grade level. Um, a little bit, a little bit confusing, but again, it, what it enables a school to do, especially schools like Santa Barbara High and Goleta Valley Junior High, who have been near that threshold for a while. In other words, there are um, a significant portion of the student body that that has, you know, substantial needs, and yet doesn't allow the the administration or the staff or the site council to expend as as flexibly on things that we know can have really good systemic benefits, like school wide professional learning, especially in a secondary setting where students experience lots of different classrooms every day. Um, so that's, that's the difference. You know, you can make sure that any, any um, acquisitions, you know, be it hardware or other tools, don't, don't, can be used in a whole classroom setting as opposed to just with a group of students in that setting who've been designated as Title I eligible, which can be very logistically challenging, even impossible sometimes. Yeah. I appreciate that because that was, as I read it, I was trying to understand did we increase our student need was increased or was always there and now we're better able to meet the need through this flexibility. Correct. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, how long has this been in process, this analysis, to get to us to this point? So we had been watching San Marcos High School, Goleta Valley Junior High, and Santa Barbara High School the last two or three years, watching for when this eligibility might tip from targeted assistance to school-wide. Um, a lot of our other secondary schools are, are school-wide already. Um, and then there are, is uh, one more remaining secondary school that's still targeted assistance. That's Dos Pueblos High School. And then La Colina is not eligible for target assistance, even much less school-wide. So that's the breakdown of our secondary schools. It's just, a, it's just a data point that we track because it does allow for more, more flexible spending. And so those two schools along with Santa Barbara, what were the two again, Goleta Valley, that are, that are near this? They're not. Oh, so, they're so Dos Pueblos is, is, target, is targeted assistance. Yeah. And then La Colina receives no Title I funds. I mean, before that, the ones that you said. The three, so we, had, we brought San Marcos last year. They crossed over that threshold last year. And then we saw in our annual CalPADS reporting that Goleta Valley and Santa Barbara High were at a point where we could bring this to you at this point this year. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ms. Ford. Thanks so much. I uh, totally understand how this is an exciting change just because of flexibility. And I just wonder if each of the principals would be willing to share with us what they're most excited about being able to do school-wide with this redesignation. So Dr. Simmons and Mr. Ortega, if you'll come up and you can each highlight an idea or two. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so for, for Santa Barbara High School, what it means is that we used to use Title I funds specifically to support one of our counselors in the College and Career Center, and um, he was able to work, um, he worked and he will still work, directly with Title I students. And the amount of hours that he has to spend to log in and show and the accountability measures will now be, he won't have to do that <laughs> and instead I'm using I'm using different funds to pay f to cover his um, position and so now I'm going to be able to use these funds to support our um, intervention coordinator that supports the program for our all 2150 students so it helps cut down on that those accountability measures and that time goes back to the kids they can spend more time hands-on with students so I'm excited about that 
Good evening, President, board members, superintendent. I think for me, it's uh, just looking at the single plan for student achievement and, and looking at the annual cycle. And so right now we're in the process of evaluating our single plan, looking at parent engagement, looking at uh, student engagement, academics, and, and then just looking at overall what we could do with all the interventions. And so as we evaluate the single plan with the site council in February, now I can start developing the presentation that I'll be presenting to you in May with our single plan with the lens of school-wide. And so what, what that means for me is just so much more flexibility and the ability to meet the needs and kind of develop interventions uh, with tier ones, tiers two, tier three, uh, but school-wide. And so um, it, it's really going to depend on what's working now, uh, see what the need is, what we continue, uh, but just go at it with the lens of every kid. I just want to say thank you so much for being here tonight. I know how busy you are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Sims Wooden. And I just had a clarifying question. It's coming from my fiscal mind. We know how we go in and out of basic aid to ADA. So once you're in a school wide, you stay there and you don't go back to targeted, right? Or is there a measurement? I mean, I, it looks like there's people around who know, might know more than I do. <laughs> We've only trended one direction, uh, so I'm not, I, I'm not an expert in that. I, I would say that it would stand to reason that you could go back and forth because that's how it should be designed. Yeah. Um, but I'm also looking at either our fiscal folks or I'm looking at some people who have other experience in other contexts are saying yes. So it, is, it, can, it can shift and should shift depending on what your, uh, what your student body need is. And so how would that come back to let us know? Would it be in the same type of similar reporting that we're now back into targeted assistance? Where would that come back to the Correct. board to let us know that? Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are right. uh, we ready for a motion? Mm -hmm. Move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Matsuoka. Item 11, retiree health care costs, finding savings. Yes, finding savings is always uh, helpful. I did not create a slide deck because uh, there's a lot of complexity in this. Uh, I know you, you're, you're so good about reading the document. I think let's go to the diagram, Mr. Rouse, the big circles. I think that's you know, a quick way to remind the board, but also the public. All right, so retiree health care costs, I, I asked uh, I think it's payroll, and it was HR, how many? 263 retirees are getting a health benefit. Good for them. Mm -hmm. um, now that has changed in the landscape of uh, public agencies. I mean, currently nobody who's hired today will have access to that. That was phased out probably, I don't know, a decade ago. Um, we do have some that are, they have lifetime benefits. It's a very small list. I mean, that was like people in the 70s. Um, so we have an ongoing cost. Um, we are a blend of pay as you go and then also saving for the future. And we get audited on this. It's part of our, you know, annual process. It's part of our bond ratings. And so when Ms. Jate and I go up to San Francisco and stand before S&P and Moody's, they look at all this stuff and they want to see are you saving for that future liability? And more importantly, do you have that irrevocable trust? And districts have been, you know, struggling to do that because some districts just don't have the money. And so this diagram shows we have two sources of income. The retirees do have to pay quite a bit depending on their plan and then the general fund. That all flows into Fund 90. And right now, well, we've been spending it in two places. We have to pay for our annual costs but we've also been saving into the irrevocable trust. And I just want to credit Ms. Jate. I mean, she really pushed this district to get the trust set up, to start savings. There was a transition out of a, um, what was it, a golden handshake program that sunsetted, so she just continued to take that money and invest it in the irrevocable trust. Now, that trust has got some things you have to pay attention to. We're, we're far away from being like at the place where we should be funded, um, I put a number about 85% is what I've heard over my last eight years. You, know, you don't ever want to be 100% because you can't pull that money out for anything other than paying retiree health care costs. So as we analyze this in the business department, just looking for savings, uh, we've been saving 
at a really, I would say, um, high rate. You know, so now, Mr. Rouse, if you'll go down to the bottom spreadsheets. So if you'll go to the that one, pause there. All right, so you just have to pretend that negatives from an accounting standpoint mean positives. All right, it's just the way this spreadsheet is built up. So all of those parentheses are really positive numbers. And you can see last year, that Fund 90 ended up with 1.73 million carried forward. Last year, or this year, we're projected to end at 1.38. And with the current model, even with your board authorization to reduce the transfer to half a million, uh, I think we asked the board to approve that a couple meetings ago, our balance still would have been a healthy 1.5 million. And there's now $4.5 million in that irrevocable trust. Okay, that's not even on that spreadsheet. 4.5 million, and I said in the report, our liability last uh, audit was 11 million. Okay, we'll get a new audit. It's gonna tell us, is it changed 11 million? Lower, higher, it's healthcare costs, age of people, number of retirees, so they recalculate that. I think it's gonna stay, well, healthcare costs aren't exactly staying flat, but our, as our retirees age into Medicare, that's the majority of them, our liability slowly drops. So it's a tension of retirees phasing into Medicare, but then healthcare costs climbing. I think that $11 million is gonna stay fairly stable. I think there's some money to save here. The analogy I'm gonna use is, you know, we have a structural budget deficit that we're trying to solve. That irrevocable trust is saving for, I'll just put a number out there, 2030. Now, it will be a great day when you go back to the diagram, Mr. Ross. <clears throat> when that dotted line, it, sh it shows dotted and when you look at it, that someday in the future, we can just use the irrevocable trust to pay for this liability. And honestly, we're probably, I don't know, eight years away from that. The model is reducing the, the savings in the irrevocable trust to half a million a year. It's still a respectable amount. I mean, if we pile up half a million of interest in a small transfer, 500K every year in two years, that's another two million. So I, I feel like we're being responsible with the future liability, but just really conserving cash for our ongoing needs. So if you go back now to the bottom spreadsheet, this is a model where, okay, 2019-20, we have one possible tool to use. The transfer to the trust was done, and it's irrevocable. Can't pull it back. But we have been depositing about 110000 every month just out of our general fund towards that liability. We're halfway through, and we're recommending that we just stop the rest of the year and we've saved 550000 towards that annual cost. And we actually have built a model where we think we can reset that payroll cost of 1%, that was the amount, to just half a percent. And what staff wants is that the ending balance never dips down to like the 250000 range because the summer months you still got to pay health insurance costs. So that's all the way out to the end of two fiscal years. So we're going to be in a good place with this if you accept these recommendations. Now, sometime before 21 or 22, 23, board should look at this. You might have to up the, you know, the transfer a little bit. We should just keep that floor at about 300,000. So there's the proposal. Um, be glad to answer any questions. Any questions? Ms. Simzoten. I just have a comment. I, I appreciate the clarity. Um, from the beginning where we're going we actually get to see this um, and I think this is a good plan but it also gives us the opportunity to review it based on what's the the environment that's happening as well to, to adjust as we go through so thank you for that Ms. Jate. Yeah. anybody else no I concur thank okay. you so we do need an action for this all right so moved second all in favor aye, aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, we can move now to take a break or we can keep on going. Uh, what would you like to do? <coughs> Probably have another 45 minutes, maybe an hour or so. It's five minutes. Five minute break. Okay, let's do it. We'll take a five minute break and come back to our report discussion agenda.
Okay, everybody, that was a long five minutes. <laughs> Let's get back. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Dr. Ramirez, we are going to turn to you for item G1, discussion and update on the development of a comprehensive plan for multilingual pathways. Well, good, ev good evening, uh, Board President Caps, um, Board of Education. So this, this, um, this particular topic is a little misleading because it's not just mine. Uh, in fact, uh, there are people here who um, really are at the forefront. Uh, so it really should be Ms. Carey and um, really uh, Ms. Maria Larios Horton, who is our Director of uh, EL and Parent Engagement. So I just wanted to offer a few opening thoughts um, to this uh, latest installment. Um, and I'd like to actually begin by just thanking the parents who are here, who have committed not just tonight, but really over many, many hours, um, and their predecessors who actually brought uh, these recommendations forward um, several years ago for us to take a really uh, comprehensive, thorough look at our, all of our programming, and more importantly, the uh, conditions that really serve up uh, the outcomes that we see in our schools today and have seen historically. So uh, in this latest uh, opportunity uh, to, to, to bring to you an overview of where we stand in the process, what you'll see is that um, if, you, if you take nothing else away, it's just the degree of intentionality that has been developed now almost um, a year back. Um, and the amount of involvement from uh, all quarters of our community, um, internally, externally, and so on, to bring you know this plan together. Uh, it's in the final stages. We just had our last um, committee meeting uh, just uh, this past a uh, couple of weeks ago, on the 13th. And so uh, I'd just like to offer up those thoughts as an opening frame, and um, then turn it over to uh, Ms. Uh, Larios Horton. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Uh, good evening, uh, President Caps, members of the board, Superintendent Matsuoka, my colleagues, and the community. Um, in this report today, I'm happy to share with you some updates regarding um, some uh, important developments related to our Meta plan and the progress being made around our dual language immersion efforts. Um, something new that you'll see on this slide is our plan's new logo. And the logo with the name selected by our community. Um, the name itself, as you may recall, uh, Meta, Multilingual Excellence Transforming Achievement, speaks to the power, language, um, sustenance, and acquisition have for transforming achievement. Let's start then with the Meta plan. As Dr. Ramirez mentioned, it's been almost a year uh, that we began this work, and we are about at midpoint in the process of developing this plan. Um, and as Dr. Ramirez mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we had our last meeting uh, of our stakeholder group. And so um, we are uh, in process of attaining our final stakeholder input. So we have a couple of community forums planned so that we can um, reach out to folks who were not part of our stakeholder group um, to really engage them in understanding what this plan means um, and what its impacts will have in our district. Uh, this is a more detailed timeline of where uh, we've been, where we are now, and where we are headed. Um, as you can see, we hope to bring to you um, a plan for your consideration in the month of March and seeking your approval in the month of April. So some of the draft sections of META that have been shared with you um, are, are listed here. In October, we shared three important pieces of our, our META plan, and they included the vision, the mission, and the learner profile. And we thought this was important to share with you um, uh, because it, it really uh, was a window into, into this plan. And of course, today we bring to you um, additional draft documents to help provide you with an idea of how this plan is shaping up. So um, the table of contents, I hope, has provided you with um, an understanding of uh, the scope of this plan um, and its 
definitely, I hope you, you gathered, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, the preface and the introduction give you an idea of um, how this plan is set up. And so then finally, um, the through lines are really the heart and soul of this plan. Um, they are uh, the ideologies based on evidence uh, that breathe life into the plan and that will work to create a sort of a gravitational force for all of us in the district in our work to transform the educational experiences of our emergent multilingual students and other language learners. So then I'd like for us to really look at this, um, the through lines, those are probably, um, the, through, the through lines are uh, one of the most important pieces of this document. Um, the through lines are grounded in this um, idea, such as this one presented here by Drs. Buckles, Casillas, and Lee, whom I may add are professors and researchers um, here at the University of California, Santa Barbara, in the area of culturally and linguistically sustaining pedagogies. So this idea that culture sustains, that is, it is culture produced primarily via language that endows experience with meaning and provides a deeply held sense of identity and social belonging. It is precisely because of the central role of language and culture in sustaining selfhood that there is a vital need for pedagogical practices that sustain students' language and culture in classrooms and other learning contexts. So the meta through lines speak to this idea explicitly. Asset-based orientation and culturally and linguistically sustaining perspectives and pedagogies were briefly introduced to you in October, if you may recall. Um, and they were presented as necessary shifts in our thinking if we are committed to moving toward multilingual excellence and sustainable transformative school reform. Our third through line, linguistic and cultural hegemony, speaks to a dangerous, underlying, and pervasive mindset that exists in our society and manifests in our ed educational system. That is, the notion that students are seen as deficient as compared to a culturally-based standard that has systemically been called the norm. A mindset that if not brought forward in our consciousness and day-to-day decision-making will continue to perpetuate the opportunity gaps for our students that this plan proposes to address. All of our through lines are presented in this document as actionable through adult capacity building. So in our plan, you will not see a lot of shiny new objects presented when it comes to you. It comes to you with this idea that through collective, collaborative learning around these through lines, um, that we are going to be able to make that change that our students deserve. So thus, our meta plan, uh, because it attends to these critical areas, becomes an important driver in the rest of our work. So our meta plan, um, as you see here in this graphic, um, demonstrates how meta would both drive, be, uh, both drive and be informed by many of our other important plans and efforts. Uh, something that I forgot to mention that I hope that you, you uh, were able to collect from reviewing the acknowledgments pages is that we have almost 90 stakeholders all together um, who have contributed to the development of this plan. And so um, META as it stands in its center um, has been informed by many, many stakeholders. So um, as is the case, uh, META uh, would be an example um, of, or our LCAP would be an example of how META would be um, a driving force for the development of this plan. A reminder that our LCAP is how we um, operationalize equity and our plan is one that attends to uh, the supplemental funds that are dedicated to um, our 
most vulnerable students, our emergent multilingual students, our socioeconomically disadvantaged students, and our homeless and foster youth. And so it makes sense then that META would drive um, our LCAP. As you saw in a previous board meeting uh, that uh, was presented to you, the LCAP is a district plan to operate, operationalize equity. And so for that reason, um, the META is going to be what drives our LCAP. So I hope that this has helped you a little bit with understanding where META fits in terms of all of our other work. And what I'd like to um, now be able to do is to shift over to what we've done with our dual language immersion planning. And for that, I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Carey. Hey, good evening again. We're very excited to be launching dual language immersion at Santa Barbara Junior High this coming school year. And we've been, uh, a team has been planning diligently um, for many months now in advance uh, of, of the launch. Um, we had a, a parent meeting in December in conjunction with Santa Barbara Junior High's open house. There are 25 students enrolled in the DLI program as incoming seventh graders for next fall. Um, and as you heard earlier uh, this evening, the shift in the model to the core, uh, the in Spanish, the Spanish language, language arts and the social science as a double block, um, having that be delivered in the target language of Spanish, and it's still the option of it uh, having an additional period, which would constitute a 50-50 um, experience for students, an optional period of mathematics. So with appreciation for your approval of the job description that Dr. Becchio presented, we can begin to recruit and, and fill the, um, the hiring need that we will have for dual language immersion at Santa Barbara Junior High in the fall. Okay, so as it pertains to our elementary, um, first a reminder that we are looking at um, at uh, this launch um, in preparation for the 21-22 school year, whereas the junior high programming will uh, begin this fall um, and therefore um, it necessitates all of those um, component parts from courses to staffing um, in the year prior, we are really looking ahead not one really effectively two years. So um, we are currently undertaking um, a feasibility study and there are four components. Uh, one is, uh, so I'll just name them, uh, name them now, uh, facilities, demographics, staffing, and community interest. Um, Ms. Capps uh, earlier uh, alluded to, you know, having received a survey. So that is the community interest component. It's trying to canvas the community for what level of support, awareness, understanding, um, input uh, the community at large would have relative to the launch of a dual language program. Um, so that is going, has been afoot, that has been set in motion. Um, it will likely, um, and we've been uh, open in prior board sessions, um, to, to um, land this program in a west side school, um, in large part because uh, Adelante already serves the east side community. And so uh, this feasibility study will come forward uh, more fully. Um, we're, we're planning on the uh, board meeting the 25th of this coming month. So there's, again, a lot of things that have been set in motion um, and that we've been trying to um, elicit more information relative to what would be the optimal uh, location to begin um, a program in, in our community that is district held. So with that said, um, just uh, in closing, because I think we're at that place, um, just to reiterate uh, Ms. Ms. Larios Horton's earlier comments about this plan being very comprehensive, really taking a thorough look at all component parts of our district um, as an organization and as a culture. And the idea being that it would be a primary driver for how to inform and um, really continue to propel LCAP into being a plan that lives up to its uh, intent uh, in our community. So with that said, we'd love to open it up for any uh, questions, uh, guidance, and comments from the board. Yeah, Dr. Reed. 
Yes, I um, I would just like to acknowledge you. You made a comment um, about shiny new objects. I think this is a shiny new object. I think uh, the work. This is an example of a comprehensive approach to bringing forward a plan that has brought, like you mentioned, over you know ninety stakeholders, and the process I think has been phenomenal. And I just want to acknowledge the work and, the, and carrying us through and bringing us, making us a part of it, guiding us through it, but also the participation. I know that Ms. Munoz will probably speak to it because she's been to many meetings as well, um, much more than me, but the few that I have been able to go to, um, it's transformative. And I think all of our programs that go through changes should be thought about and brought forward in a way or, or in, this, in this process. I, I think this is a process that we should try to replicate if we're going to change something or if we're going to bring something because it's bringing forward the community, it's bringing forward parents, it's bringing forward the um, educators, it's bringing forward um, so many different voices to the process. And so I just want to, I mean, I'm, I just want to acknowledge that. and. Um, Ms. Larios Horton, for your work, I know that this is a passion of yours. I also think um, the support that uh, you bring forward and the DLAC committee, all of the work that you're doing um, to support our families, and certainly I'm so impressed with the uh, voices and the communication and bringing forward the ideas from those meetings in DLAC, and I just want to acknowledge that we are on a great pathway and this is an exciting um, new development and I'm 100%, 150% behind this program and I'm excited to see as we go forward how it unfolds. So I just want to thank you. Excellent. Ms. Ford. Uh, thanks. Ms. Carey, I had a question about uh, the junior high. You mentioned there are 25 students who have signed up already. Is that right? Yes, and I was wondering what kind of outreach was involved? Like, for example, did someone go to Peabody and talk to people about, uh, talk to the sixth grade classes about it? Or how, how did you get 25? And what else is planned? Um, so different, and you would understand uh, what I'm about to share, which is that starting at a junior high school is somewhat different than starting from an elementary school where our outreach definitely has to be um, much more broad and robust. Um, one of the reasons, as presented literally a year ago today, if you were to go back to our presentation from January 28th, 2019, um, we brought to this uh, board, to you, um, the plan to extend to junior high school in response primarily to the need for our Adelante charter school students to continue upward. Um, to start in a dual language immersion program beginning in seventh grade requires um, quite a bit of linguistic um, study before before joining a seventh grade, if you have not been part of a dual language immersion program from the beginning. And so the all of our students are from Adelante Charter School. Um, we did promote uh, online um, the opportunity for others who don't necessarily participate in a charter school, or I'm sorry, in a dual language immersion program here in town to um, let us know if, of their interest to test into the program. And we, we, did, not, um, we did not get a, a, a response in terms of folks who, students who would be um, entering, who would want to enter the program as seventh graders. Um, one other piece to this could be that when we receive students who are new to US schools, um, that they join this cohort as well, so it becomes an opportunity for them to join the whole cohort and, and to grow it. Um, but there's certainly, this being our first year, we're open to feedback and um, willing to learn along the way. So, but in terms of answering, answering your question, what kind of, we, we did not go out to schools to recruit. 
because the number of students that are prepared to attend a dual language immersion at junior high, the who have not been, again, are few and far between. Um, hence why we need this plan, <laughs> so, so that we have more opportunities for elementary students coming up uh, by literate. <clears throat> so um, what's your maximum then for next year? Thir 33. 33. So we have space for about eight more students. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. And then Dr. Ramirez, I had a question about elementary. Um, sure. Would it be possible for the board to see a copy of the interest survey, community interest survey? Sure. I think that would be really fun yeah. to take a look at. Yeah. We purposely made it uh, very, sorry. Yeah, we, we purposely made it very accessible and very, um, well, very accessible and, and not too tedious because we wanted maximum participation. And we extended it also to our internal staff uh, because we wanted to get a gauge not just of um, parents and families, of course, that's important, but also where our, um, what type of uh, support uh, might, be, might exist amongst uh, our teachers and staff internally. Um, so we are, we've been in, in some discussions about a uh, board study session to, to now, once the plan is formalized with action items, to be able to unpack that more fully with you. Um, and so that could also be another avenue for us to uh, share with you the survey and the survey results. And that is a component of the feasibility study. Uh, thank you. So I, to clarify, it sounds like maybe within a month you will have the study completed and you will make a recommendation on a school? That also? is correct. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Munoz. Yes. Well, you know, as the sessions that we had, you know, the parents and the students and all the many stakeholders, we really looked at, you know, the breakdown, all the different components of this and how to best implement it. Um, it was very impressive. I knew every time I went to a meeting that we were all going to be, you know, figuring this out and getting input from everyone and then also coming out with what was the best way to uh, implement it. And as you said, you know, the culture and the la um, language go hand in hand. So it will be um, a strong program. Well, I'm sure, you know, you'll be learning once it's implemented and such. And I'm very, you know, very excited about seeing this first group uh, come through the junior high and um, to go from there. Um, I'm, I'm also planning to go to the community forum and would love to, you know, also as um, Ms. Ford said, see what the surveys, you know, what the results from that are. So I was very excited <laughs> and appreciate, you know, all of your help and guidance in this. Other questions or comments? Thank you so much. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Thanks for the presentation. Okay, uh, Mr. Vizlini, you back, please. Item G2 which is the first reading of proposed procedural accounting change for bond-funded projects. Good evening again, board. Um, like many of our divisions in Santa Barbara Unified, we continue to look to improve our practices. Um, one area, oh, there's nothing for you to look at, sorry. <laughs> oh, one area um, that we've identified is the way that, the method that we pay our contractors. Hey, Brian. Okay, we're good, sorry. Um, so it's, it's how we make our monthly payments and change order payments to contractors. Um, so typically what happens is we come to the board and we get a, a project approved, and in our Munis um, financial system, we create a purchase order for the contract price. So the contractor will then submit these, uh, these pay apps, which is, uh, you know, toward the end of the month, what have we gotten done this month, and we make a payment. Um, the, one of the things about Munis that makes this difficult is that um, they're only allowed to do one transaction per purchase order. So until one of them makes its way all the way through our process and accounting, a second one can't be processed. So if we get a change order right after one of these pay applications, our contractor ends up waiting sometimes a bit of time uh, to get their money. Um, one of the ways that this really is a problem for us is when it works the other way around. So um, we'll use Santa Barbara Junior High as, a, as an example. If we get a change order <clears throat> that's over $10,000, we have to put it on the board list for approval, right? In order to put it on the board list, we have to submit it in Munis 
seven days, 10 days before a board meeting. So it sits there for that time until it gets approved and then it works the rest of its way through. So we've had a pay app come in in between that time and um, it ends up being pretty hard on our contractor if they have to wait for the change order to get through and then they also have to wait for their pay app and their pay app is much larger in many cases. So like at Santa Barbara Junior High, it might be a million dollars. So we're telling them for this $10,000 change order, you have to wait 10 weeks for your million dollar monthly payment. And that it really affects how they pay their subcontractors and how they think about future planning for you know ordering materials and things like that for the job. So um, in working with our fiscal division, I think we came up with a solution. And what we'd like to do is have the board consider approving the project and the contingency at the beginning. So as you, real, as you remember, we have a 10% contingency budget for every project. So what we would do is come to the board with our action item to approve a contract for construction. We give you the hard cost and the, the maximum that we would spend on contingency for that project. And we'd ask you to approve that. Um, what, then what we would do is we would create two purchase orders, which frees up the funding. So we could do our pay apps whenever they came in. We could do our change orders whenever they came in. Um, so um, we think that that makes it so that it's a much simpler process for our staff. It'll make it streamlined for our con contractors to get paid. Um, and with the understanding that um, we do have a contingency cost and we would not exceed that without coming back to the board for approval. So we're not, we're not saying we're never coming back, but if we got to that 10% for some reason, we would come back with an, an item for the board to look at as a change order. And if you uh, are agreeable, what we're asking for is to come back at the next meeting and have this approved on consent. How does that strike everyone here? That sounds good. Sounds good to me. Thank you, Mr. Bislin. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Item three, presentation of Santa Barbara Unified School District's annual financial reports. Mr. Tay. Good evening, board members. So tonight I have Ms. Grusby um, from our, she's our auditor, auditor partner and from Ide Bailey, which merged with um, Veronique Trine and Day Company or VTD. So they've merged. So you've noticed on your um, pamphlets on your desk or your, or your, on the dais that you have um, quite a few bond, uh, quite a few audits there. You have the financial audit, you have measures Q and R and measures I and J. Q and R, this will be the last time you see it because there are no more funds in Q and R. So goodbye bonds for those. So I'd like to bring up Mrs. Grusby um, to give her presentation on the board or the audit. Good evening, thank you for having me here tonight. I won't take a lot of your time, but I will go ahead and give you a brief uh, summary of the audit for June 30, 2019. And of course, I'm always happy to answer any questions that you might have. So we'll start with the district's audit as a whole, um, and then I'll, I'll touch on each of the bond audits as well. And once again, this is for June 30, 2019. And of course, our audit always starts with our opinion. That's why we're here. So page two is, is our independent auditor's report, our purpose of which is to provide you um, some, what we refer to as reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are materially stated based on our audit. And there's different levels of assurance that we can provide you. So tonight's report is an unmodified opinion. That's the highest level of assurance that we provide you. So that means that as presented, we do believe the financial statements are materially stated. And what I'll add to that is, um, you know, how do we connect that back to the unaudited actual um, information that you receive way back in September when, um, when the unaudited actual document is presented to the board. And so we had no audit adjustments to the district's financial statements at the unaudited actuals and so um, that should mirror the information presented tonight and then in addition to the opinion on the financial statements page 102 see look at how I just skipped a hundred of pages just just like that um, the page 102 does a really great job summarizing the rest of the audit there are components to the audit outside of just the opinion on the financial statements that we provide you reports on one being an internal control report over financial reporting it's a required report um, for governments and the idea of this report is not an opinion it's to bring 
bring to your attention areas of internal control deficiencies that may come to our attention while we're doing our audit. And so that would come in the form of either a material weakness or significant deficiency. And we're happy to report that's clean report. So no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies. Um, we also provide a report on federal federal awards, and this um, report is a compliance opinion. So we are mandated um, to audit specific programs based on requirements, the, the size of the program, and, and, and so on. And so you can see kind of at the bottom of the screen, um, special education and your uh, Medicaid cluster were the programs audited for 2019, both of which were unmodified uh, opinions as well. So clean opinions, so no non-compliance issues to report. And last but not least is the state awards. So many programs we have to look at from the state perspective, they dictate to us what programs they want us to look at, and then we provide you um, an opinion on that, and that's an unmodified opinion as well. So all the programs we had to look at, another clean report. So um, that's the district's report. There are things that come up uh, on occasion from time to time that we don't believe rise to this level of reporting, a significant deficiency or material weakness, but we do like to bring them to your attention, and we do so um, in the back of the report starting on page 108. Generally, you'll see some um, ASB-related items and maybe some other minor um, control observations that um, we've brought to management's attention. And so I'll pause there for questions on this report if um, you'd prefer to, to do it that way. Any questions on this one? Ms. sims uh, I have a comment and I have a question. So mm -hmm. thank you. I mean, it's good to see that there essentially there are no material risk and uh, overall it's a good clean audit, so I can appreciate that. But I do have a question because it continues to be an issue, uh, but not although not rising to the level um, with regards to our ASB accounts. And so my question would be to our fiscal staff. So the recommendations that the, that the auditor is making, how are we implementing those uh, recommendations to for change? Should I defer? I'm not sure who is it Meg or. <laughs> Sorry. Hello? So um, what we usually do is we alert the, the, the it's, I don't think you're on. Here we go. Um, usually we, we always alert the, the site that's being involved. Mm -hmm. We also have to write a recommendation. The county always will ask us, what, you're, what are you doing by, for this? And we meet with the person. Alana Matlick is our CPA, one of our internal auditor, and she deals with the ASBs. We meet with them and go over what the audit has found and look for ways of improving those processes. So, and they're part of the solution when we write the recommendation to the county. I appreciate that, um, but I know for the three years that I've been in, in the three audits that I've looked at, we still have that even though we have recommendations for improvement, it doesn't seem that we're really getting there. And so how do we then take, again, these recommendations and implement them to the, because, because what I'm seeing is, is the potential for fraud they're even larger if we're not implementing these recommendations at that level. So I'm just I'm just trying to and I understand the complexity of it as we have discussed in our audit meetings. I'm just trying to how do we get there and we're not at this level of recommendations. So each time they audit different locations, right? So we also recommend that these these um, business officials go to training with FICMAT that's held usually at the county ed office. Mm -hmm. We also have three new, brand new office managers, I mean uh, business managers, so they're, they're learning also. And I'm not saying that's the reason why these are, are um, continuing, but it's also a, a rotation of the audits that we have to, we, they find the issue, and then we have to reach out to all of them and talk to them about it. It's, it's really hard when you have so many people involved in ASB funds. There's a lot of hands in ASB funds. And I can appreciate that, I, I really do. But I, 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 even though we're rotating, is there a process by which the new person rotating in has some framework or, or foundation from which they're going to go? Because it's, it's higher than just this. It's just that there is the potential for fraud, fraud because we kind of say it's it's turnover, we're going to send you to training, but it's not really changing the culture of that, or at least the expectation of that. And so I just don't want to see it 
get further down the road because we haven't really done that. So uh, when you talk about how difficult it is, and I respect that and, and understand that, but what do we need to do? Because whether it's at this school, this this time there will be other there will be other mm -hmm. sites that they're going to as should you know alternate the sites in which you audit, but it's still essentially the same issue. So I'm just looking at the larger issue, how we did. It doesn't matter where you audit, but we still have the same issue. So that's where my my thoughts are with that. Okay. Yes, Miss Ford. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, I was wondering if you could describe, it's in the uh, a term that's in the letters, sensitive disclosures. Is that just a word for problems? No, um, you know, it, and, and I, I would touch, I'll, I'll touch on the letter now since you um, brought it up. Obviously, so with each of the audits, you have a separate letter from us as the auditors. Generally, there's nothing to report in those letters. So um, we bring things to your attention that, um, you know, might, be something you wouldn't read in the bound report. Um, I always point out a couple of the obvious, you know, if we had a disagreement with management or difficulties completing the audit, we want to let you know. As it relates to sensitive disclosures, so, you know, disclosures could be sensitive for different reasons. So um, I haven't seen any particular disclosures we would classify as sensitive for a school district, but maybe there are, maybe there's disclosures related to related party um, type of transaction that we would consider the nature of the transaction to be somewhat sensitive and we'd want to bring it to your attention to make it more um, forward um, in those communications. So um, the general school district practice doesn't typically have any Anything that would rise to that level, it's probably more of an issue you'd see with, um, you know, just maybe larger governments with more complex or unique type of um, accounting practices and policies that might have some sensitivity to them. Okay, You're welcome. So for the bond reports, this is easy because you've got four of them, but we'll, we'll wrap them all up in one. How about that? Two of them are going away this year, as um, was already mentioned. But for all four of the reports, we did still do um, both the financial audit, which for each report is specific to its measure, uh, the financial statements particular to those me the each a measure. And then, of course, the second component of that, which is probably the one that is mo of most interest to you and the users, is, is the compliance um, audit, which each measure has its own bond language, its own um, approval. And so we have to look at the expenditures to make sure for each one that they're compliant with the language as written in, in, in the bond. And so um, for each of those reports, unmodified opinions on your financial statements, as well as um, clean compliance audits with no um, non-compliant expenditures identified from our testing. See how that went? Four reports in 30 seconds. <laughs> Good. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ms. Carey, item four. 14 new secondary course requests. 14. 14. But I'm going to bundle them too. Um, so we're at the time of the year, as I've you know said annually, when we are looking ahead to um, course requests, master scheduling, and staffing up for next school year. I'm actually going to walk th us through these a little bit out of order. Um, so if we could look at number eight first, Mr. Rouse. Um, yep. So number eight, I wanted to start there because it uh, connects to both the job description and also the meta presentation that you've heard earlier tonight. So this is the course that we've been referencing that requires your approval for us to offer and run it. This is the, the, the core ELA, or in this case, SLA, Spanish Language Arts and Social Studies course, the double block period that will be the kind of the capstone experience in the DLI program at Santa Barbara Junior High. Yes? Uh, what designates it as honors? Uh, well, we what we had as a conversation there was that um, 
while we are identifying and examining what I'm going to call some problematic practices around uh, the designation of all courses as either honors or CP in our junior high space, we didn't want this n nascent course to be um, something that students uh, would be disadvantaged by, t by taking um, since it is a new course. Um, and we do feel that the rigor of uh, accessing the content um, in a language other than the, the dominant language of the academic system that we're in, um, we felt that there was sufficient grounds to designate it as honors. It's not nearly as regulated as what happens in the, sec in the high school system with the UC um, oversight. Um, it is an, a, a local determination that we made as a team. Thanks. So all our all our academic courses in junior high are designated as college prep or honors. Um, virtually all of them, yes. Excuse me. Other questions on this one? Uh, now I'll scroll up to number one. Uh, so then this one is a, is a standalone. The remaining dozen, you know, I'll be able to offer the same comments about all of them. Um, so this is a, a new course. This is a course that I think sounds really intriguing. This course request is coming, or, or request for, for new course approval is coming out of Santa Barbara High. Um, and so again, I think the intent is to actually offer both part one and part two. It's designed as, as the first year in a two-year sequence. It is an, uh, an, a, an advanced placement elective. So... Um, I can I can try to answer any questions you have about this request for approval. So I think this is just something that they're excited to offer in their course request and see what the student demand is like for this course. That's good. Any questions? Okay. okay. Keep going. The remaining dozen, um, I can offer the same comments about all of them, and that is that uh, you as a board approved in December a contract with West Ed, um, which uh, allowed us to explore, identify, and, and ultimately adopt uh, the, the expository reading and writing curriculum as an appropriate curriculum for ensuring, helping us to ensure um, our district's compliance with what is law when it comes to um, guaranteeing that our emergent multilingual students have both access to grade level curriculum that their English speaking uh, peers experience as well as the designated English language development that they that they are that they deserve and need and so what you'll see here is courses at every grade level that are co-requisites one and with the other so you'll see the pair for English 12 and the pair for English 11 on down the line, uh, both for the grade level course and for the course um, that's specifically going to confer the designated English language development. Um, I will just highlight with appreciation the, 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 the wording that we use. I, I want to just highlight the use of the phrase emergent multilinguals as opposed to English learners. I think that that will put us on the cutting edge of these courses statewide, and so I'm proud to bring these courses um, forward, you know, sort of packaged as they're packaged. I'll also note that this will now, um, these are A through G courses in the UC system, which the current courses that students are in, the literacy courses, do, uh, do not have that status. And so this is not only giving our emergent multilingual students access to both the curricular experiences they need, but also some of the status that comes with the, the, the courses that they'll be taking from, you know, in, from this point forward into the future. Okay, any other questions, comments? So these are then uh, ones that we will bring back. Next meeting, is it the preference to bring them back on consent or action? I think that's fine. Consent. Consent is okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Okay, uh, moving on, budget update. Mr. Matsuoka. Again, a pretty short, straightforward report. It's actually two pages. The dollar amounts are on page one. That I split out the narrative on page two just because it was going to be too big a table. Um, I think I'll just highlight, uh, Mr. Rouse, if you'll scroll down. It's a blend of in new income, uh, good news, and also finding savings. Um, some pretty significant savings from the technology team. Um, you know, our laptops last 
Well, we're trying to we're going to stretch them out four to five years. I mean, my laptops in my career have lasted sometimes four years. My last one only lasted two. Um, but we think we can stretch it out. The other one that's very notable, travel and conference. Um, we're just freeze. It's the word soft freeze. Like we'll still let people go if it's essential. Um, restricted funds we can still expend, but uh, unrestricted, we're just saying no more trips. Talk to your bosses if you really need a trip. Now that's two hundred fifty thousand that we're just going to not spend. And through that, we actually looked at the, the trends in our travel and conferences, and we're going to dial that back next year, okay, by about 20% from this year's budget. So, you know, just getting eyes on all this, um, I think we can save money and get a, a good budget developed just by examining everything. So the savings so far as of this report printing is $3.8 million. Um, Savings continue to be found and accumulate. So we will bring an updated report to you February 11th. And I, I'm saying this in front of Karen McBride. It's not a secret. All of this is helping us get ready for negotiations. Um, we had, again, a very collaborative process uh, we launched at the table. Um, we worked on some language. And we got some initial financial requests from them. Um, so now it's our job to figure out our budget. And I'm really confident that by February 11th in closed session, we'll be able to get you some final data so that you can authorize um, some numbers that we can take to the table. So a lot of good hard work. Um, it's getting harder, though. Um, that list came together, I wouldn't say easily, but relatively easy. The next, next layer is going to involve just, just a touch of restraint on the part of our sites. All right, we'll communicate that very clearly to our principals. I spoke briefly with uh, Karen here, and we'll, we'll vet the message with her leaders just so that everybody understands why we're doing this. Um, but as I mentioned briefly in the narrative, we're not talking about any program changes. You know, there's no reductions. There's, you know, we just, everywhere we can where there's discretion, we're trying to pull back. So questions, Ms. Ford? Um, thanks, uh, and I apologize if I miss this in, nar in the narrative, but in number 11, what's the nature of business division savings? It's the only number that's very specific. Yeah, there's a, an account that business tracks, and it's really, um, it's, called, it's like a rainy day fund. And so as savings comes in or new income comes in, they build a spot because then they get asked to solve issues across the district. So the way I've learned about it in the last, I'd say, couple of weeks, it's like, okay, money comes in, and they park it there. For example, the superintendent search was not budgeted, because when we developed the budget, you didn't know I was going to retire. And so that's a place where they'll take it out of there. Um, so we're going to make some adjustments with that number. It's still a valid number. Um, I have to provide some tools to the staff, because if we sweep it, they need some flexibility to still solve, like, superintendent search. So as a placeholder, um, that 200,000, we'll just need to provide some, some room for the staff. So are you saying that uh, you're taking a chunk of it out and there's still another bit of money there? Well, I, we put that into the list about, I don't know, it was about a week and a half ago. And then over the last, I'd say, week, I've learned that it's just an operational necessity to solve ongoing needs. So here's my goal. We're headed towards $5.5 in budget deficit. I may need to modify that line name, but I'm going to find a different saving so that we still hit 5.5. Okay. Ms. Simpson. Uh, I just had a comment. I just want to express my appreciation and uh, acknowledgement of what the you know what it takes to actually find those savings, recommend them, having gone through a budget process myself. So I, I, I totally uh, understand and walking in your shoes with regards to that, and I know that takes a lot of um, effort on the parts, not only of the, the folks that's recommended, but uh, at our sites as well, recognizing that we're really trying to get us toward a goal, so we're decreasing our deficit spending and in order for us to do that um, successfully we all have to do it together so but I, I just want to express my appreciation for all the efforts that are going into that so thank you 
Any questions? I have a couple questions. Sure. Thanks. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, also, how you've laid this out, it's very clear. But could you speak a little bit about, um, well, I have two things. First, I applaud the travel and conference um, cuts. That's 250 out of what, approximately? Uh, this year's budget total with restricted, unrestricted was 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Uh, I think that's important. Um, I'd like just, just the big number. Um, Number 10, if you could speak to that, because certainly that's, um, I think that just merits a little more explanation. Yeah, so I'm going to work with staff, and this is both the fiscal and then Fran Wagonick and John Shetler. Mm -hmm. um, I would say position control and monitoring that. It's like we, we have a budget, but then it actually swung negatively in terms of our costs were rising, but it turns out it just wasn't, we weren't being knowledgeable about all the positions. So there's some positions that we didn't fill. We actually tried to be overstaffed in special ed because we always run into people departing. Right now we're just, we can't find people to hire. Hmm. Right now, are we fully staffed? I'm looking at Dr. Wagonick. We have. We are not. We are not fully staffed. We do have one position, one teaching position at Lucumber Junior High, that we have tried to fill all year and have been unable to hire for that position. And so this really, um, in the line where it says not needed, it's not that the folks aren't needed. It's uh, some of those we believe, and again, that's what. Mr. Matsuoka is um, talking about is we need to look and see if perhaps some of those are um, paraprofessional positions that we haven't been able to fill that instead we filled with the maxim so we might be double counting on Friday we're going to be doing a, a more in-depth look at that with uh, Lacey and John Shetler. Thank you I just encourage we have such an active special ed advocacy group, parents, et cetera, if we can be as communicative as possible, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, uh, let me be really clear, and it's, we're, we're staffing to every IP, every need. We're, again, we're not talking about, you know, position cuts. This is more of an accounting of position control, how many people we planned for last spring, how many we thought we needed. It was rolled into the budget. Turns out we don't need all the positions, but, Every classroom except for the one has a teacher in there. So. Right, and we were willing, that, that's an important piece to drive home. We were willing to be overstaffed and looking to be overstaffed because last year we were running so short at, at certain parts in the year, and those um, shortages just haven't come up. So part of it's the overpreparedness, but we are um, down one teacher this year. So I think. As explained in the narrative, just to state uh, that this, the, these cuts don't reflect any staffing cuts. Correct. Thank no you. staffing cuts. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Ms. Munoz. Yes, I just wanted to say, you know, I appreciate the thoughtfulness and the, you know, breaking it down so that we understand um, and going forward for the, you know, coming year to also mm -hmm. um, reassure that the school district will be in a good place mm -hmm. financially. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're in agreement on this plan. Thank you, Mr. Matsuoka, and all the work that went into it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Um, okay, we are moving on to um, item I, coming events. Any coming events that we'd like to discuss? And, oh, item J, I'm gonna send out a um, future agenda items Oh, do you, is that what you want to talk about? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you can you can raise it here, and then I'm also going to be sending you all a Google Doc to just keep the list going. So expect that in a couple of coming days. Great. Um, so since the closing of OAS, there's been um, a committed group of educators and parents and community members working steadily to really divine, you know, design a, a new school and um, a new progressive elementary school. And... Um, I would like to propose that this group be able to present um, to the board um, about their outdoor education and ecological literacy program 
and um, it sounds really exciting to me. I know we're on the forefront. We're pushing really environmental movement around, but also sustainability and environment and ecological literacy here. So I would really hope that we could have an opportunity for them to present and share about that. Great. Yeah, they reached out to I'm going to meet with them soon as well. So great. Great. Sounds good. OK, any other ideas? Or we can, I can just, again, solicit them. And we do have a, a packed, packed agendas in the, this phase of the school year, but still want to encourage uh, new agenda items. I noticed a misprint in the Tuesday, February 25th board meeting. So it says the board study session for Menta, 5.30. It really needs to be 4.30. I, th I think we've checked with everybody here that that works because 4.30 to 5.30 will be study session, and then we need closed session from 5.30 to 6.30. Okay. Okay, so let's just make sure to, re when we print next, next time, Sandra, and then uh, make sure your calendars say 4.30. Okay, well, I adjourned it already at the beginning of the meeting, but now I will adjourn us again. But we're not oh, going to adjourn. We're not done. <laughs> oh, we are not adjourned. That's right. I keep teasing with the adjournments. We are going back to... <laughs> we're never adjourning. We're going back into closed session to discuss the last item in closed session, which was B5. And we will be back to adjourn. Thanks.